Uh, we have a lot of events planned uh, coming up this year, so if you haven't already done so, please follow us on our G Plus page. Uh, there are a few very exciting events coming up, which we will talk about later. Uh, again, I won't take too much time because we have a very exciting lineup of speakers. So we get started just before, uh, just uh, one thing before that, I'd like to thank DeepSet for hosting us and uh, also. Uh, the guys who helped organize this event, Hindu, Stefan, Rasika, Dihan, uh, I think I got everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, let's get started. So Stefan is going to introduce the first speaker. Hi everyone. Um, so today's first speaker is Rasika Karnakilika. He is the general manager and head of shared services here at Leapset. Um, Leapset is a company that's based out of Redwood City, California. Um, we send with our disruptive engineering center and operations located here in Sri Lanka. Uh, we are an associate company of Cisco, Cisco Corporation, and we are basically a technology platform provider for the restaurant and hospitality industry. Uh, Raska has over 16 years of experience in the IT industry, and he, before this, he was a senior program manager at Millennium IT. So, good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so my presentation has, has two parts. Uh, the first is, is what I call the brass stacks uh, of entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, I'll try to follow some basics uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, uh, particularly to give uh, those of you who are planning to launch out uh, into a career in entrepreneurship and uh, create a new venture. Uh, hopefully I can give you a few tips on entrepreneurship. And part two is, is inspiration, which is also important. Uh, we'll take a look at a few examples, uh, 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 some recent uh, successes uh, from the Silicon Valley, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to illustrate uh, how some of these these companies have been successful. So, uh, what essentially is entrepreneurship? <coughs> so, uh, it's a process of creating something new, a new enterprise, right, with value, devoting the necessary time and effort. Uh, assuming the, the accompanying uh, risks and uh, also be prepared to accept the resulting rewards uh, which includes you know, your personal satisfaction and independence. So uh, <clears throat> to summarize, if you, if you want to be rich right, and if you don't want to work for someone else right, and if you uh, uh, feel that you can gain some personal satisfaction and independence by launching out your own venture, then you should be an entrepreneur. So there are four distinct phases of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, the first is the most important. Uh, that's the ideation process. Right? Uh, it's, the, it's a phase where you come up with, with a new idea. And most importantly, uh, it's the phase where you will evaluate the opportunity and, and do sufficient due diligence uh, to examine whether your idea is viable, right? whether it spans uh, uh, the test of time, uh, whether you can overcome all, all challenges that you might face in your journey. The second phase is the development of the business plan, which is a very important document. Uh, <clears throat> it's the document that you will use uh, uh, to raise funding for enterprise. The third is assembling or required uh, resources, which may include uh, your human resources, your hardware and infrastructure resources, uh, other, other resources related to logistics, etc. And the fourth stage, uh, once you've covered all three of these stages, is the ongoing management of the enterprise. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, after you come up with what you feel is a viable idea, you need to conduct detailed market research. So, um, the best way to do this is to check with potential users of the system on these aspects. Does it meet, meet a need that, that your, uh, your target user group can identify with? Does it really solve a problem? or uh, does it create one? Have your users seen anything like it before? Are there similar products in the market? Uh, who are your competitors? The fourth is uh, whether you can actually make money. Right? How much will potential users be willing to pay for it? So uh, this is the phase where you evaluate other products and come up with some pricing right, for, your, for your product. The fifth is uh, what is your distribution strategy? What is your go-to-market strategy? And how will your, your, your target user group expect to purchase it? And sixth, 
is whether they will actually recommend the product uh, to other people. Right? Is, it, is it suitably viable for your users to recommend it to others? Analyzing the competition uh, is also a very, very important step. Uh, uh, very often, uh, entrepreneurs go gung ho with a, with a single idea. They, they do not really consider the competition, uh, and uh, so that can have dangerous pitfalls. So check out the current and potential competition in the market. Uh, the best way to do that is to list out the benefits of your product. So list out the top 10 benefits and identify how, how each competition is different. With respect uh, to five attributes, uh, brand, performance, right, price point, functionality of the product, and your current user group. Right? <coughs> it's, it's very important to differentiate. Right, and, and create a potential barrier to entry uh, to other competitors. Um, so a recent example uh, of a company that's been overrun by the competition is, is Groupon. Right? Uh, the very next day, there are a number of copycat products. And uh, uh, the Groupon's initial fortunes have now since diminished. Some other recent failures are, are Sony, uh, a giant uh, back in the, uh, probably in the 80s, and uh, the household naming electronics. Uh, they failed to spot the threat posed by the iPod revolution. Sun Microsystems was uh, the company that we all looked up to uh, when I was starting my, my career back in the 90s. Uh, they have been overrun by the competition as well. In their case, they, they failed to spot the significance of their software business. Uh, they could have really capitalized on, on uh, Solaris as well as uh, Java, but they failed to do that very quickly. And they had to be bought over by other. <coughs> Another recent example is BlackBerry. Uh, as you know, uh, completely vanquished by, by the iOS and Android market. So um, uh, your fortunes can change very quickly, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, technology. So it's very important to stay on top, uh, constantly uh, identify who your competitors are, and, uh, and continuously try and differentiate and create a barrier. Uh, so resource requirements, now uh, <coughs> this is the stage where you will identify what resources you need to take your product to market. Uh, so as I mentioned, it could be either human resources or uh, uh, other types of resources. Uh, you need to identify the cost and duration that you will need these resources for. So list down all the resources that you need right, and, and mark cost as well as the duration. Uh, for all the resources that you need across these five stages, right? So this, the typical stages are uh, <coughs> product design, product development, the production process. Uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the phase where you actually uh, develop your product. Right? It's, a, it's a tech product. Uh, distribution of the product, as well as uh, sales and marketing. So these probably the most important step uh, for an entrepreneur, right? The business plan. So this this is a document that will capture all the actions that are required in your entrepreneurial uh, and go to market journey. So um, it is very important to have the document for discussions with all your stakeholders as well as uh, your investors as well as other partners. <coughs> the process of developing this plan that will force you to think through all the issues right, that you will come across. Uh, you know, from, from the point where you launch uh, up to the point where you break even. And uh, a vital component of the business plan is the revenue model. How will you actually make money? Right? So there are uh, sample business plans uh, on the internet. Uh, uh, if you actually launch in, uh, into entrepreneurship, so just to take a look at some of those samples, understand how, how a revenue model works. Um, so you will typically list down all your costs and uh, list down your, your revenue and identify the duration uh, uh, at which you will break even. There are eight critical success factors uh, uh, for entrepreneurship and these are the parameters by which uh, your stakeholders and investors will measure you. So if you go uh, to a VC meeting uh, in the valley, uh, these are the eight criteria by which your investors will, will judge you. The first is, is your innovation better than the competitions? Right? So they, they will look to see whether your product actually is innovative and whether your innovation is sustainable. 
Number two is whether your product is actually ready to go into market or whether it's still in the development phase. Right? So you should only launch your product after you're sure that you can actually take it to market successfully without any big holes. Number three is the uniqueness of the product. Does the product stand alone or in a product? Number four is your first customer. Right? Is somebody actually willing to pay for it? Uh, so these uh, applicable in the case of a large product, but it's internet based, they will probably value you depending on, on what, your, what your market size is. Right? That's point number six. Is the market actually viable? Right? Do you have a, what is the demography that you are targeting? What is the, uh, what is the market size? Right? And can this product go viral? Number seven is the entrepreneur, that's yourself. Right? Uh, your investors will judge you and uh, try to ascertain whether you have the right stuff to make it succeed, whether you have the right attributes. And there are some vital attributes uh, for an entrepreneur uh, that are coming up in, in, in the following slide. And of course, number eight is can, can your venture actually make money? Right? What's your pick up a financial plan? A plan? Uh, is it a viable plan? Right? And does it stand up to? Uh, uh, all the rigorous question. So these are the typical qualities of an entrepreneur. Now I expect some of you are probably uh, thinking of launching your business or, uh, or trying to decide whether to be an entrepreneur or not. So these uh, probably uh, a good slide to take a look at and uh, to determine whether you actually have the attributes uh, to be an entrepreneur. So first and foremost, you need to have an optimistic power. The glass always has to be half full and all that. You need to be resilient in the face of adversity. Uh, all the entrepreneurs that I know uh, in the US have constantly encountered difficulties, but they actively worked at those difficulties uh, and really got through those, uh, those hurdles, and that's why they're successful. You need to be fully committed, fully committed uh, once you get into it and decide to be an entrepreneur, launch your own business, there's no going back. Action and goal oriented. So, you need to be a bit like uh, Richard Branson, for example, high energy, high action, hands-on. You need to know everything about your business. Uh, the fifth point is probably the most important, in my view, uh, the willingness to take risks. Right? Some people are uh, slightly risk averse, some people have more tolerance for risk, but uh, the most successful entrepreneurs have all taken risks. Uh, now some, some analysts feel <coughs> that uh, Entrepreneurs are born and not made, and that you need to have a genetic predisposition, and so on. Be that as it may, um, <clears throat> you need to ascertain for yourself the, the risk tolerance and determine whether you are actually prepared to take uh, the necessary risks to launch your business. Good leadership skills, good negotiation skills, particularly when it comes to uh, asking for money. Good people skills. Entrepreneurs should not be big headed. Uh, you should be willing to listen and learn, particularly from those who uh, traversed this path before. And continuously look for ways to improve. Uh, it is very important, as is uh, uh, the value placed on creativity and innovation in general. So assessing these critical factors, uh, here are a few tips. Um, there's a very excellent online resource called TechCrunch. Uh, look it up. Uh, you get to know everything that's happening in the Silicon Valley. Uh, what the successful startups are, who has invested in who, who has bought over who, all that. If you read through it uh, uh, for a couple of weeks, you will also get new ideas, new product ideas, because uh, they focus a lot on the innovation aspect. Um, uh, so uh, <clears throat> go through it and, and hopefully you might come up with a winning idea. Uh, use Sri Lanka as a test bit. Now the reason is uh, Sri Lanka is still a small market. There is still uh, insufficient competition in the market. So it's a good place to launch your, your prototype and see whether it actually works. Solve for the Dumbledore problem. Now, what this means is, if you come up with a product uh, that can be used by 1,000 people living in Dumbledore, then the product will probably be successful. And you probably can launch it uh, across Sri Lanka. So most companies, uh, due to economic reasons and social reasons, focus just on the Colombo line. So that's, about, that's a few thousands. Right. So, think of a way where you can <coughs> mass market the product. To raise initial capital, you'll have to approach the three Fs. Now, the three Fs are friends, family, and fools. So, that will be your initial source of funding. Um, 
until you get get to a prototype stage and until you can actually approach an investor, right? And you have the credibility to, to ask for capital. Now, I'm told some people feel that, that funding is the main issue in Sri Lanka, but I'm fairly reliably uh, informed uh, that it's not the main issue. Right? The main issue is coming up with an excellent idea and a good plan right? and building some credibility. Uh, there are a couple of organizations uh, in Sri Lanka uh, that are actually looking to invest. One is the Lanka Nature Network. Uh, there are a few uh, private equity firms that are interested, a few companies, including some large corporates. Um, so if you come up with a good idea, build up uh, uh, the necessary networks, uh, the initial funding, at least, talking about uh, Series A, uh, should not be too much of an issue. Network and build your pool of contacts, particularly in the domain that you're looking to launch your business in. Uh, the more people you know, the better. Right? You'll gain access to a variety of different resources. When building a, 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 a venture, a, a tech venture, it's very important to start off with a very highly skilled team. Right? In particular, you need to have one good friend, and that's a good technologist. You need to find one guy who can be the uh, future CTO of your company, who will uh, uh, who will sort all your problems out from a technical perspective. Another good resource to have is a good product guy, a good product manager, who can conceptualize and design the product. Um, initially, of course, uh, when you're starting off, hiring good resources may be a challenge. When we started off uh, a few years ago, nobody wanted to join us. At least, none of the senior resources. Somebody from Virtuosa like Chandika wouldn't have dreamt of joining us at that stage. So you need to build up a little bit of a brand, right? expand a little bit to hire good resources. But uh, one thing I can suggest is there are a number of companies in Sri Lanka that you can partner with and, in, and enter into a BOT arrangement with. Right? So that way you can uh, uh, build up a small team uh, and get a product off the ground and then look to uh, launch off on your Correct mentors now uh, uh, do not underestimate the importance of mentors. Uh, mentors are people who can uh, who can advise you, who have traversed the same path before, who have who have experience, uh, particularly in the domain that you're looking to launch launch a venture in. Beware of the entrepreneur's blind spot. Now some entrepreneurs in their zeal uh, and in their eagerness uh, fail to spot the pitfalls. Uh, sometimes it may be a flaw in uh, in your plan, in your, in your business plan, or it may be a flaw in the technology. So uh, <clears throat> try and identify what the pitfalls are. Do not get too emotionally attached. It's, it's important to be committed, but not too emotionally attached to your idea. Because some people get so caught up in the idea that they fail to change track when it's too late. So um, it's okay to fail. Now that's another thing about Sri Lankan culture. Uh, you immediately become an outcast. If you fail, even your family disowns you. So, in, in, the, in the Silicon Valley, it's quite different, right? In fact, VCs actually look for people who have failed once before because they feel that you've gained some experience, you've uh, encountered the hurdles, and that you'll be successful the next time because of your experience. So, um, for failing, fail fast. That's 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 a crucial thing. Uh, do not take time failing and start to start, start over again. Despite all that has been said <coughs> up to now. The odds of a new venture succeeding are low, so uh, that has to be remembered. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, only one in 10,000 ideas are actually viable. So um, <coughs> there are many factors to assess. Uh, consider everything, think, think big, decide if it's really worth doing. And if it is, take the plunge. Otherwise, don't. I don't want to be held responsible at any event. So um, on to part two. Um, so, um, just a quick overview of, of the Silicon Valley. Um, there are two 1 billion users, and they create massive dollar value in a very short period of time. Okay, so, um, of the three giants that I listed here, uh, Facebook and Google are just about a decade old. They are about, Apple is slightly older, but these are some of the biggest companies in the world. Apple at 500 billion uh, US dollars uh, is probably the largest. They were, so they slipped down a little bit uh, at the end of last year, but they are, they are catching up. Some of the recent uh, successful Silicon Valley companies, 
uh, have a few attributes. They cater to an emerging industry, right? an industry that's in its infancy. Uh, they are frequently internet-based. They connect millions, millions of people. Uh, and that's particularly uh, due to the advent of the uh, smartphone as well as the tablet now. And importantly, they also monetize the very high levels of traffic. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of examples. The first is a company called Airbnb, which you may have heard of. This place isn't mine, but I'm staying here for the weekend. It's not a hotel, and I had never met my host before yesterday. So how did I end up here? I booked it on Airbnb. Once I knew I was coming to this city, it took just a quick search on Airbnb to find what I was looking for. A clean, comfortable, affordable place to stay. There's a wide variety of listings and searching is really easy. Just enter your dates and browse through pictures of available places. It's free to list, so people all over the world are posting their places, making the possibilities endless. Guillermo rents out his extra bedroom to help pay for rent. And cat food. Before you book anything, you can read reviews left by previous guests and hear all about their experiences. If you have any questions, you can message the host directly through Airbnb. When you're ready to book, you just put in your request. Airbnb holds on to your payment until 24 hours after you've checked in. After your stay, both guests and hosts can leave reviews for each other. It's a great way to share your experiences with the community and to help everybody find the perfect fit. You can stay a night, a week, or a month if you want, at any price point. You can stay in a private room in a place with other people, or you can stay in a home by yourself. These people are out of town for the weekend, so I get the whole place to myself. When I'm out of town, I put my place on Airbnb. It helps me pay for all my adventures and lets me treat myself to something special once in a while. And with so many unique places available all over the world, why wouldn't I? Plus, I can book from anywhere. Airbnb lets guests and hosts choose the experience they want. And on top of it all, you're saving money. And a great Airbnb experience is so effortless that the only thing left to worry about is where to go next. So, uh, <clears throat> this company was founded in 2008 uh, by two chefs called uh, Joe Javaya and Brian Chesky. So, uh, <clears throat> the story goes that uh, they just finished uh, their graduate studies and they moved to San Francisco. They were looking for a place to stay and they found this, uh, uh, this very run down apartment but they couldn't pay the rent. So um, uh, what they decided to do was buy two cabins right, and rent it out. Uh, there was a large design conference uh, in San Francisco that was coming up, uh, and all the, the rooms in San Francisco were completely booked out. So Airbnb stands for Air Bed and Breakfast. So uh, they rented it uh, out, provided some breakfast to their guests, and apparently it was very successful. They continued it uh, uh, for a few weeks, and decided to expand it out and, and get other listings. They first created a small website, simple website, uh, uh, to generate listings. And now today, <coughs> they're the largest company uh, 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 of their kind, with over 500,000 listings in about 192 countries. Uh, very keen interest from, uh, from the VC community. Y Combinator is a well-known uh, startup accelerator. Uh, their model is to retain a fee of the booking. I believe it's it's something like six to nine percent of the entire booking. They carry the largest inventory of rooms <coughs> uh, without owning a single bed. So more rooms than, than the entire Hilton, uh, Hilton network. They have served about uh, nine million guests so far, and their current value is uh, five million US dollars. Two years ago, uh, around uh, November uh, 2011. Uh, they were valued at 1.3 billion. So that's the exponential growth in value they are talking about. <clears throat> they are currently a NASDAQ IPO candidate and they have ambitious plans of, of uh, going public at uh, a value of around 10 million US dollars. Next company is uh, uh, one called Ubercab. Welcome to Ubercab. Ubercab provides on demand, high quality car services requested from your iPhone or SMS. To use our iPhone application is very simple. First, log in. We'll determine your general location. You hit the pick me up button and move the map underneath the stationary pin to determine your exact pickup location, such as southwest corner. Hit confirm pickup location and at this point we'll send your request to our network of drivers, only sending it to the nearest available driver. The driver can hit anywhere on his screen to accept your request and we'll see your name and Ubercab client rating. 
At this point, you can set a destination for your trip. Click the Set Destination bar at the top of your screen and select from one of your saved locations or put in a full address with the city included and confirm that destination. Upon arrival, the driver will hit Arriving Now. This will alert you and you'll need to hit Begin Trip in order for him to start the fare. When he hits the green Begin Trip button, this starts the billing of your fare. We provide your destination to the driver with a pin on the map. Upon completion of the ride, the driver hits End Trip and that closes out the fare. The driver has the opportunity to rate you one through five stars and you have the same opportunity to rate the driver. This rating system keeps the quality of our participants very high. At this point, the driver goes back on duty and we would ask that you provide a bit of feedback about your trip. Once you submit your feedback, you're finished, ready for a new ride. Thank you for using Ubercab. We're available now in the iPhone App Store. So again, very simple product. So just imagine if you could do something like this. Uh, this is called the, uh, the three-wheeler problem. You know, in Sri Lanka. Uh, again, very recent company, <coughs> founded only in 2009. So that's just about four to five years. Uh, all real-time requests. So the, I think the most important feature in this product is that you can actually see the, the cat coming to your doorstep, right? So the, 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 the user is always kept well informed. Uh, currently, taxis are always on time. Uh, they have a good feedback mechanism where both the driver as well as the uh, uh, consumer is rated. So that, that creates a framework of trust. Uh, so the model is to keep a fee of, of the right. Uh, they have also expanded very rapidly. They are in almost 50 countries. And uh, they are also launching into other services like on-demand delivery as well as logistics. So a uh, very keen interest from, uh, uh, from Google. Uh, they've just closed a uh, big round of funding. And they're currently valued at uh, 3.5 billion US dollars. Again, two years ago, around uh, August 2011, uh, they were valued at just 330 million. So again, uh, caters to a massive market. Right? Uh, as you can see, they've launched in 50 countries after starting off in San Francisco and uh, exponential growth in value, uh, uh, which is one of uh, uh, Leap's uh, competitors. And uh, unfortunately for us, they are doing quite well. <laughs> Let's get ourselves connected. Gonna get yourself connected. Well, one app I use a lot when I'm traveling is OpenTable. It's based on the web reservation system that's been around for years, and it's pretty simple to use. It uses the GPS location feature in the iPhone, which is kind of nice. I can simply type in how many people I want to go to dinner with, this situation here too. It'll then list out all the restaurants that are around me. And it's pretty cool. You can go into the restaurant, see which times are available. I can also scroll down. I can view the menu. I can get a general idea of what the price points are for the different menu items. You can also get reviews from uh, other diners that uh, have eaten there. And I like this feature too. It's got a parking feature. It'll actually give you recommendations on where to park. So if you're not familiar with the city, very handy. It's called Open Table, iPhone app. It's free, super easy to use. Very simple product. These are what are known as Mickey Mouse uh, products. Uh, the development is not complex at all. I suppose any one of you uh, can easily develop, develop an application like this. Uh, a very simple problem, right? restaurant reservations. Right? They started off again in San Francisco, uh, as with the other two companies I talked about. And they are now active across uh, four or five continents. Right? So they, they handle reservation management table management and they've now launched into uh, e-marketing and other, other services like, uh, like reward points and, and online card solutions. So they keep a percentage of the transaction as well. And uh, again, uh, 27,000 customers, these are actual establishments, so that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a fair number. 
and uh, they went public a few few years ago, and their current market cap is about one and a half million uh, dollars. So all three of these companies, very simple product, caters to a massive market and builds exponential US dollar value in very short time. So this is my final slide. Uh, this is a bit about uh, uh, opportunities in, in the restaurant industry, uh, which is the industry that uh, I'm most familiar with. Uh, so talking about the US alone, there are about a million uh, uh, restaurants. They employ about 13 and a half million people across the industry, so it's a massive industry. Uh, last year, uh, the turnover was about <coughs> 760 billion, right? so it's one of the fastest growing industries in the US. There is also very keen interest in, uh, in, in uh, food tech startups. Right? So uh, uh, over the last two years, there have been a lot of investment coming in, and, and last year, about 350 billion uh, US dollars was invested in, in food startups. This is also a virgin territory. It's a massive untapped market, uh, still in its infancy. Most restaurants in the, in the US don't even have an internet connection. And uh, we found that about 60% of the restaurants uh, uh, in the entire Silicon Valley Bay area only use a traditional cash register. So they don't even have a point of sale uh, unit. So um, uh, for that reason, there are a number of you know, new entrants into, the, into this space. Because of the fact that it's a very huge market, right? Uh, there are a lot of competitors, but that's uh, not so much of an issue because of the size of the market. Right? So all you need is to get a, a small slice of pie. So um, uh, the industry has changed significantly over the last couple of years. Uh, 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 from a technology perspective, there are things like touchscreen ordering, uh, various smartphone applications. Uh, at quick service restaurants, you get these touchscreen uh, kiosks. Uh, those are designed to eliminate queues, you know, like in bags. Virtual menus, so if you go to a restaurant these days, uh, the server will not come to you with a hard copy of the menu. Menu is on your table, it's built in. Right? The server will come with an iPad and take down your order, which is uh, recorded at the kitchen as well as the cashier. So uh, there are a number of different areas where technology comes in in this space. Outside the restaurant is, is the piece where the restaurant interacts with the consumer. So a couple of companies in this space exclusively, one of them, uh, which focuses on, on reviews, and uh, Grubhub focuses entirely on, on online ordering. The front of the restaurant is the, is the restaurant reservation piece. Uh, uh, there's open table and a new company called Corporate Crumb, and a number of other, uh, other players. Um, so within the restaurant is the whole uh, restaurant uh, operating system. So uh, all cost vendors are there. Um, Rebel Systems and Postlavu are two examples of companies that have uh, migrated uh, their systems onto, onto iPads. Right? So iPad based uh, POS systems. Square is a new company that was uh, founded by Jack Dorsey, the, the Twitter founder. They are doing very well as well. There is uh, Micros, uh, which is a large player, but um, probably uh, not as innovative as some of the other companies. The back of the restaurant is the uh, is the inventory management and the logistics piece. So that's a new area. Most uh, 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 restaurants and, and other players in the hospitality industry haven't really thought about managing the inventory well. So there are some new companies in that space. And then there's a whole uh, new space uh, related to business intelligence. Uh, we've actually created an entire big data and data mining team to, to exploit this opportunity. Um, so just one example would be, generating some, some business intelligence around uh, what dishes uh, you know, sell best at what time and what demography of, of consumers actually uh, uh, have that dish. So that's just a simple example, but there is a number of uh, different parameters that you can, uh, you can examine just at a restaurant. The entire payments industry is also changing. Uh, uh, mobile payments are now, now in vogue. Uh, there are technologies like uh, I beacon, near field communication, RFID, and so on uh, for payments. Uh, uh, so that's, that's a very hot and emerging industry. And there's a lot of potential there, uh, even if you focus on just a small piece. And of course, uh, the entire reward and gift card uh, uh, systems. So um, that concludes my, my, my presentation. 
there are any questions uh, at the end, have you? First, I have a question. Like, uh, you said, like, use Sri Lanka as a test bed because it's a smaller market and all that. But what about the protection? Like, for example, say that I, I come up with a great idea, but what sort of protection do I have that somebody won't rip me off at the moment? Yes, so that's, I think that's, a, that's a topic that has been discussed quite extensively. At the moment, there isn't a very uh, really mature legal framework. Right, so what I would suggest is initially to be cautious about revealing all the details about the idea until you uh, you actually uh, you know launch out and develop a prototype. One way to do it is of course to uh, to sign an NDA with whatever parties that you disclose information to. Uh, uh, Ruindu, any thoughts on, on, on that question? So that's uh, Ruindu Pires is. Uh, running uh, the MIT GSL uh, program in Sri Lanka, uh, which you might have heard of. Uh, they've rounded up about uh, 70 university students, and uh, uh, we have had some lecturers come down from <coughs> MIT in Boston. And that program is very successful, so that's one of the main entrepreneurship uh, initiatives uh, that we have in the country uh, at the moment. This question is on the on the legal uh, framework. Do you have any? Sure. I think it's a genuine concern. Uh, one, for one piece of advice that I would say is that execution is key. Ideas are actually worth jack until you execute. Um, and I think you just need to try out stuff. Right? In doing that, um, what one thing we're trying to do is to work with uh, people like Nitya Partners, FG and Serums, and really kind of put some stuff. But at the end of the day, it's also common sense. I think how you do it is um, you know, before it becomes a huge IP <coughs> situation. Just need to kind of test your idea, and I think my experience at least has been is there's way too many people who are thinking of ideas with the, and fearing things that might happen without actually putting them to test and actually getting some traction. But it is a problem that we we'll have to solve. But I think these problems, you know, have, you have these in every country, so I don't think we should hold back. And solve them. Yeah, I think it's a part of taking the risk. Yeah, yeah. Also, and uh, my question is, I have, for example. Uh, uh, we have a concern that it's genuinely inherent to Sri Lankans, I don't know, but when we start a company and we look for an investor or someone, we, we, ne we generally have to give them a portion of the equity of the company, basically. Yes. So, for, for, uh, for, for myself, I, I don't really uh, like that idea of giving some part of the ownership to that person and they're doing nothing and actually getting part of the money. Because that's, you know, in my genes, it, I feel it like that way. So it, I believe it's a problem for a lot of people. So are there any methods of actually mitigating that risk for the actual uh, pers the person actually doing the job? Is there any way to mitigate no, so that? So the sense is, I mean, unless you're very, very rich, right, you will need some funding. Yeah, right? yeah. So typically how it works is, uh, in the valley, you would bootstrap your organization. Right? You can start off from most companies now, even there are some very successful <coughs> companies that are still working out of their their, their basements, right? But they are internet based, so no one knows where they are, right? So you can probably minimize your costs, right? Particularly if it's you know internet based, uh, all you need is a few desk chairs, a few laptops, and a good internet connection, right? To get started on. But uh, to, to grow your business, you will definitely need funding, right? So first step is angel investment, uh, and then you get Series A and Series B to take your company uh, global. You will certainly need that, but of course, uh, I mean, uh, there are ways to protect the interest both of the investor as well as the uh, uh, the actual partner. How do you value knowledge? I mean, for example, a person giving knowledge and another person putting in money. So, how do you actually give a value to the knowledge? That is, what, what's the worth of the knowledge? So, the value of your knowledge is, is your your percentage of equity in the company. Of course, yeah. you get diluted uh -huh. as investors coming. So, that's why investors are investing in you. It's for that knowledge. It's for your knowledge as well as for your. No, is there, for a, the skill? Is there an established way of actually uh, measuring the amount of uh, measuring your knowledge and your effort? No, no, uh, I, I don't think that there's an established way. Right? There are models by which you can uh, distribute equity. Right? Uh, Well-known models. So uh, uh, typically, VCs use those models when when investing. Uh, can you name a few? Yeah. So. Um, so you will have to look online, right? Offhand, 
uh, it's a little too complex to get into those uh -huh. models, but uh, uh, why don't you speak to us after the event and we can we can uh, basically point you in the right direction. Uh -huh. Speak to a few of the people. Here we have some university academics as well. That's Dr. Madhura Parma who uh, runs the uh, uh, entrepreneurship program at the Open University. So uh, I, I can just tell you, I can share with you if you talk to me later about how uh, a piece of Lankan Asia network you to get it. Uh -huh. Rashid, how do you think uh, the, the Sri Lanka now? I guess if there are <coughs> startups, the first test down should be Sri Lanka. How, how mature is Sri Lanka restaurant industry for this kind of innovation? So, um, if you take only the restaurant industry in, in Colombo, I would say the market is still still small. And there are a few players already in the market. Uh, have you been to uh, Ministry of Prayer? It's a restaurant at the uh, old, old Dutch uh, hospital complex. So they have a nice system, right? Which, which covers end to end some of the uh, components that I, that I spoke about. Uh, but in Kalama, you probably have about 200 restaurants. So you will have to go nationwide if you're focusing only on that industry. No, but how much is the market? I mean, so it's, it's a difficult it, market it, to crack. It, 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 uh, innovation? It's, or? Yeah, it's still in its infancy. Right? There are some tough problems to crack because the market is also probably not as educated, not as technical. Right? So we face similar challenges in the US. So, uh, those are barriers to crack. But that problem pertains to a lot of industries, not just the yeah. I just want to add to that. I think sometimes what, what we miss sight of is also everyone's focused on US and Europe, whereas one of the most lucrative markets is Asia. And I think if you take that view, Sri Lanka is a great test bed also from a cultural perspective and some of the nuances of what, what's relevant in the region. So you can use Sri Lanka as a fast test bed and then quickly get into Bangladesh, Indonesia, whatnot. Um, and even Singapore, I think, you know, if you just go into yeah. Singapore, there is enough stuff you can Exactly. So Sri Lanka has a population of 20 million. Just think if you get, if you can get 3 rupees or 5 rupees from each person, if you can develop a product to do that. Uh, that's what I spoke of earlier about solving for the double the problem. There's a product that can be used across Sri Lanka, right, by all people. From the farmers, right up to the, uh, the light. Um, I mean, I often say that the business plan is the first thing you throw out of the window. Um, you stress the creation of the business. Sorry, business. didn't get you. You stress the creation of the business plan. Yes. Um, and often it's you know known that that's the first thing you discard when you're embarking or when you proceed with, with your business itself. So, uh, so I'm curious, just from your perspective, Airbnb. Um, and those other examples, you know, at what stage do you actually formalize the business plan? So you need it definitely when you uh, go to ask for money, right? So uh, I would say after prototype creation, after you generated some value, when you're ready for your uh, first serious round of funding, that, that would probably be the point where you uh, need to document everything together and go with a very credible plan to your investors. All right, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we have uh, three more speakers. so. Uh, uh, we have a, a short networking session after the event is over, so please feel free to tap, uh, tap the brains of some of the, uh, some of the participants and some of the uh, guests. Thanks a lot. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so the next speaker who will be coming up to address you is Chandrika Jayasundra. Chandrika is the co-founder and CEO of Synergy Sync Creatively and has been in the industry for 14 years. Uh, Synergy Sync Creatively, they are in the rich collaboration, knowledge visualization and reuse space. They're headquartered in Melbourne, Australia, and they have an R&D center here in Colombo. So, without further ado, this is Chandra Gitarski. So, uh, hello. Uh, quite happy to be here. We uh, have a large audience. And, uh, so, the, the topic I'm going to talk about is uh, about finding success. So, all of you guys who are trying to start a startup or work on a startup, uh, or just, you know, in life, uh, you're trying to find success. So, uh, so hopefully, I can help you find success uh, by sharing some of our experiences. So, just to introduce, uh, so Synergics, we we have uh, we focus on collaboration and productivity, and Creative is our first product, and uh, so it's uh, it's a product that you can draw uh, from flowcharts to mind maps to ML and, and so on, and uh, we have. Or uh, you know half a million users uh, that are using the product, and we have some very nice you know global customers who are using uh, using our product uh, for mission critical applications. And uh, 
So we started off in uh, 2008 uh, in, in Australia, and soon after we set up things in Colombo as well. And uh, we have six product variations from there's an online version which you can use in the browser, there's one that you can use on the desktop that you know has offline sync and so on, there's a server version, <coughs> plugins for various platforms, and so on. And uh, we are a profitable uh, software as a service company uh, that's growing. At some years, uh, we've grown at over 100 percent, and now we are going to grow at over 50 percent year over year, uh, almost double the revenue in some years. So, so we figured out a few things over time uh, on uh, on how to how to do this, uh, how to get here, because it's it's not really really very straightforward uh, running a startup. So. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, is around this concept called lean startups, uh, and you know uh, these are these are some uh, some some very uh, amazing people uh, have shared their knowledge, and I'm basically you know uh, telling you our interpretation of, of this stuff. So it reads uh, Stephen Blank and uh, you know a bunch of other people. So look these guys up. There's lots of, lots to learn from them. So most startups fail. So as in there are thousands and thousands and thousands of startups. People get lots of people get ideas, uh, and then you know ideas are a dime a dozen. Uh, and then whenever you think of an idea, you probably uh, if, if you think you know that's a great idea, I should do that. It's likely that uh, another you know a thousand people in the world also got the same idea, <coughs> because ideas are not made in your brain without any trigger. Uh, it's it's always because of some situation or some uh, 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 a confluence of events leads you to have an idea about something. Or well, this is a great solution for this problem. So what's, what are the chances if only you face the problem? So if only you are facing the problem, that's a bad idea anyway, because you're the only customer for that problem. Right? So, so I, possibly there are thousands of people who thought about it. So maybe about 100 people will think of doing something about it. Maybe 10 people will actually do it. So somebody asked this question earlier, should I share my idea of how to solve this problem? I think you literally should share your idea. Uh, people have different opinions on this, but from our experience, it's better to share your idea immediately with as many people as possible so that you know whether you're, you know, you're going to waste your time or not. Because it's uh, simple as that. Somebody stealing that idea is not just, not going to happen because they are not not very interested, they might not. they have other things to do. These people are busy. Lots lots of people who you might go and talk to have other priorities in life. Uh, and and execute an idea takes a lot of time. So lots of startups fail. And uh, <coughs> even this map should be updated as in I think these startups are a little old and maybe like one or two live right now. So why do these startups fail? We'll get to that. So let's define a startup first. So a startup is a human institution designed to deliver a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So this is interesting. So it's a human institution. It's, it's a bunch of people uh, who are going to deliver a new product or service under extreme uncertainty. You have no idea what's going to happen, right? Because it's something completely new. So, if somebody had already done it, if you're if you're doing a, a web design agency, or you're doing software consulting, or you're building custom software for people, that's not really a startup in this definition. Yes, you're a startup because you're small and you know you're trying to do it on your own. That's a way to talk about it, but that's not the kind of startup we're talking about. We are talking about startups that can be can be Airbnb or can be Facebook, and these are startups that try to do something completely new and executed really well so that they got to a, got to a you know inflated size and got got a majority market share so so when you're doing that you obviously don't know what's going to happen so it, it has nothing to do with the size of the company or sector or anything so facebook was recently a startup they 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 are still a startup at some parts of their company for example mobile was a startup inside facebook uh, in the last year, they figured out mobile finally in the last year. Before that, they were they were going all over the place. So, so that's basically a definition of a startup. So, if people have, are we supposed to take questions at the end? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll just I'll just do this. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll probably uh, get off the topic. So, so when us when you when you do a startup, the this is the cycle. So you you initially build something 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 that's really good. You think, and you have the TechCrunch of initiation. So TechCrunch is a publication that lots of people read. So it's it's like getting uh, getting on the front page of say Sunday Times or whatever uh, in the tech world. So initially you get a huge you know, amount of traffic and a bunch of people talking to you. So right now it might be it might not be TechCrunch, it might be magical and a bunch of other sites. These guys feature you, uh, you you get it. So it, it, we we got featured on on TechCrunch as well when we launched. So it is amazing. You are you know thousands and thousands of people came onto our site. And then these people are just checking you out because they are just reading news. And then it just goes down, right? So the novelty just wears off. So some people check it out. There are, lot, there are lots of uh, lots of like you know games and lots of apps. People, lots of people start to use it immediately. As in, who now plays Angry Birds? Who played Angry Birds? So yeah, so that's that's what it is, right? But Angry Birds was very successful. It was not like a spike like this. It, Ran for some time and then made, made a lot of money, but you know that's basically what happens. The fat wears off, and you're no longer interested. So it wears off, and then you you know figure out. Uh, is there a point in this? Yes. We do. Okay. So so you figure out you know it's going down and it's, it's flat now, and then this this phase of of running your company is really really hard because there's no hope. Suddenly you had lots of people who came to you. And now no one's interested in you, and you have like a few people who are just hanging around out of pity, maybe. And uh, you know it sucks. And then you know you try to do some stuff, and it goes down even further. You think I should kill myself. Then it comes back up. You do some more new stuff. Some more new stuff. Okay. Then suddenly, as in you keep making changes because you're trying to figure out, okay, why is this not working, right? Some people liked it, no, but not enough people liked it. Why are they not coming back? <coughs> So you keep making changes and suddenly you hit something that over time, as in all the stuff that you did comes together and suddenly it can go up. Because suddenly you found something that interests the, interests the mainstream of your audience. So you, you want to get here. So getting here is, is what, we are, what we define as success. Right? So all those startups that you, as in all of you guys know about startups that are successful. Right? People know about Facebook. People knew about Friendster and MySpace. And people know about Uber and all these things that we just talked about. As in, how many people know about... I actually, I can't tell you of a startup that I don't know. As in, that, are, that is not successful because it has you know, completely gone off of my mind. But there are thousands and thousands of startups that existed. Lots of very smart people worked on these startups. Right? And they no long no long exist because they failed to get here. Right? Or they just died somewhere in here or something happened. So so yeah. So this is to get here, you need this. This is the most important thing you will ever see if you're trying to do a stuff. Right? So this is the product market fit fit uh, triangle. So it, it basically after you get product market fit, you get into the growth phase, you transition into a growth phase, and then you grow. So product market fit is when you have a solution to a problem that people in a certain market will uh, will appreciate, and it, as it it just has to match. So it just has to match, meaning it has to match at a product level. Saying you're you're trying to solve the problem of the uh, the three wheel problem, right? You want a three wheel. That when you want a three wheel, it's never there, or they don't want to come, or you're traveling too short a distance for them to come. They are not bothered. All these problems are there, right? Or they are you know they are charging overcharging. These are problems, right? Now you're trying to build an app for this. So at a product level, it should work, right? It should. It should say it should work on. It should not work on iPhone because majority of Sri Lankans don't have iPhones, right? Majority of Sri Lankans who might be the target audience might have uh, feature phones or maybe you know some 
generic Android phones that might be affordable. That's your audience, right? So you can't build it for the wrong person. So you have a have a nice Android app and a, and a smartphone app, a feature phone app. Then you have to give you have to have three wheel drivers who are open to using technology to do this. So you, have, you can't have a very complex app. You probably have to have multilingual. So all these things, little little things, will have to matter, and you have to get that product right. Then it's still it's still, it's still not done. You then need to have need to be able to get to market with it, right? So you need to have the right sort of communication around it. You need to have the right channels. You have to have the right partners. You probably have to have a you know uh, like a uh, you know video kingpin who can you know say you know all my three guys will use your app from day of today. So that sort of thing you need to figure out how to do that. So after you do that, then you might as in after you test it out for a bit, then you might get to product market fit. After you get to product market fit, then you know okay now my product works in this market <coughs> for these people. Say there might be of the 20 million Sri Lankans, there might be uh, you know 500,000 Sri Lankans who have who are equipped with a phone that you can they can use it, are open to using uh, an online booking service for, for three wheels, and uh, you know can the, has the spending power to basically uh, you know give you some benefit of, of being uh, being a customer of yours. So now you probably have captured at this time about 10,000 people for your service. You want to get to the other 409,000. So that's your transition to growth. You're figuring out how do I get this mainstream. So you amp up your marketing. You change your product a bit more so that people tell others using your product and that sort of thing. And then you finally hit the gold mine and then you invest more into the company so that you can grow faster. That's the, that's what this whole story is about. So to get here, right? So to get here, we don't get to product market fit by by magic, the first time you do something, it never ends up. You never end up having product market fit. So you use this term called a pivot. You change what you are doing at, at a product level, at, at a at a whole company level, so that you can uh, you can figure out what uh, what works, what works with this market. So so the most successful startups have pivoted. As in, so you start off with a brand new idea. That saying, you know, I'm gonna try and do this, and you think it's great. You maybe you even have some customers, people using it, but that is not good enough. If I go back, that is not good enough to get here. You're some, you end up here, right? So you're trying to get, trying to get to uh, the uh, the growth phase of our startup so that it can actually have product market fit. So you have to change what you're trying to do. So, YouTube was a video dating site. Facebook was uh, face smash, which was like a, you know, you show to people and ask people to vote whether, you know, which person is hot like. Uh, that was Facebook first. Apple was computer kits to assemble yourself, but before that they were selling some, you know, illegal stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Instagram was a, uh, was, uh, you know, Instagram, uh, who knows Instagram? Instagram. Everyone this uh, so I, I was at another forum and I asked them and they, they didn't know. Uh, so that's why I asked. Uh, so Instagram was a was a check-in service like Foursquare, but Foursquare was really dominated in the market and Instagram uh, Bourbon was was a crappier product and or they didn't have the right mix of things and never worked. Uh, but when they looked at their metrics, what happened was they they saw people were using their photo. I will take photo and use it some sort of thing in there a little more than actually checking into places. So they were using the product as a photo, photo app. So they were like, you know, let's, let's delete almost 90% of our code and rewrite this whole product in, in uh, 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 to, to take pictures and then put filters on it. And uh, let's give it away for free. Which they did. And they, Grew to a huge number of, I think, you know, some 50 million users or so, and Facebook bought them for, for a billion dollars, I think, yeah, for, for a billion dollars. Uh, and they they went from that day, the, the day they changed their app, to the acquisition by Facebook in about 18 months. So that is ridiculous success, and uh, that is, as in, that's really cool. But 
interestingly, uh, if you really think about, if, as in if you knew what was happening at, at that time, uh, uh, Instagram was not the first app to give you filters and solve the photo, as in the problem Instagram solves is that people take, people love to take pictures with, with the iPhones, right? Let's say, you know, whatever phone it is, people love taking pictures. But all these pictures look bad because essentially cameras on the phones are not as good as they are your DSLRs. So what do you do? You give it an interesting effect on it so that the pictures end up looking better, right? So that's the fundamental premise of it. So it's a very simple, nice solution to a, you know, mainstream problem. But, uh, so for the, sorry, uh, Instagram been invented, as in there were so many paid apps on the market called Hipsmatic and uh, some pick something and so many, about 10, 15 apps that were 99 cents that you can pay and get an app that you can take pictures with and put filters on. Exact same functionality. What did Instagram do? They gave it for free and promoted it right because they were after users. So, as in not everything is a brand new idea, what they what they did differently was how they executed it. And uh, and they, they eventually won and none of these hypsmatic or other apps exist today because nobody's willing to pay for putting a few filters on your on your pictures. So it's interesting how you how you change. Uh, and and uh, then also you know group one, Microsoft, Twitter, PayPal, Nokia, Sony, all these guys changed. You know? Nokia was a Nokia was selling boots I think. So, uh, gumboots, right? So, uh, as only it has reinvented itself so many times. It's right now, you know, they they messed up as as uh, uh, as we spoke earlier. They messed up uh, uh, their mobile strategy and with iTunes and so on. But they are reinvented themselves right now. They are selling their PC business. They are spinning off their TV business. Doubling down on PS4. As in, so companies reinvent themselves to adapt to market, right? So the, the key is to figure out this process. And these are, as in, you don't have to be a large company. It's, it's easier to do it when you're a small company. Figure out how do I change my idea so that I can actually build a company that is, build a, uh, build a startup that is actually going to mean something in the end. So pivoting is, is, a, uh, is the word we use to talk about this, uh, this thing. Uh, it's called, you know, change the, change the direction, but you use the learning that you had from earlier. So, so we'll, we'll tell you, as we've pivoted a couple of, uh, you know, couple of times, and, and uh, that's how we've gotten to this stage. As in, uh, and that's, that's why you know, this talk is so interesting to me, personally, uh, because we have actual experience of it. So, in, uh, in 2000, uh, we, so we started off a fair, fair while back. Uh, about 2007, 2007, and uh, we uh, we started off with building a product that was completely brand new and completely <coughs> amazing. That you know everybody who looked at it was like, wow, this, this is amazing. What we did was we helped people draw uh, draw diagrams or draw these create designs that had intelligence built into them. So every everything that you draw uh, would have. Uh, would have data and, and behaviors so that you can model anything from a computer network to electronic circuit to even figure out building a car. So people can create components of, of as in, imagine it's, it's, it's very much designed based on, on this concept of systems thinking, which helps you say, uh, as in, how do, you, how do you build a house? Right? How, how, do you, how do you build a computer? A computer is a, is a co combination of you have your Motherboard, you have your CPU and and you have your display, and you have to put these things together so to build a computer. But inside, if you break it down, you can break it down even further. The, the processor is broken down into you know a, a GPU and so on and so forth. The motherboard has so many <coughs> chips in it. So all this stuff comes together and you build it up. So when you do a design, you can assemble components and build a product that that basically works. So in real life, how you would do it, you would experiment with physical things, but uh, but uh, what we did was we built you a virtual thing that you can, you know, you draw a network and we'll tell you, okay, you have too many, too many pieces in your network, or you have, you don't have enough bandwidth uh, to actually do, the, uh, you know, to run this sort of network in your com company. This business process is taking too much time because you have uh, too many, uh, 
there are there are these things blocking your process. It's it was it was really cool, uh, and and everyone thought it was really cool. We we uh, as in it was extremely disruptive and you know all the nice keywords, and we spent about a year developing it, and then lots of lots of investment and lots of expert opinion and lots of lots of stuff happened around it, and we we patented the stuff and you know the whole shebang, and. And uh, so, what did we do, right? We, when we started off, started this off, we had a solid plan of what we wanted to do, right? And we won so many awards. And uh, you know, we first off, we, we were in Australia, so we won the Melbourne Business School, the top prize of it, and we were like one of the, one of the top five startups in, in the in the state, and we raised some money. And we spent a year developing it. You know, we we had some as in. Yeah, we got some really great people to work with us. And we built an amazing tech tech platform, and we launched at Demo Fall and TechCrunch 50 in the US. And you know, we we were the only uh, you know we were the only Australian company that year to do that, and we were the only Sri Lankan company that we were done because this, that was a big deal. Because uh, for example, these events, the Demo, uh, was the event where uh, Java launched. It's the event where E Trade launched, the Devo launched, uh, Skype. Skype launched there. Uh, all very big name products launched there, and you can't just go and launch. Uh, you have to be chosen to launch. Every year, about a thousand companies, thousand startups, which are you know well funded, full of amazing people, apply to launch, and then they have an interview of what your product actually is and what they do, and then they choose you based on merit, on how disruptive or important this product is to the audience and. Then they put up, put you up on a stage, bring out all the press in, in you know, all the press in the U.S. and you know everyone writes about you, talks about you, all this great stuff happens. And we did this, and this was you know this is amazing, and we we, you know, we thought we were on the top of the world and all that. Uh, so then uh, this was the outcome. So we didn't get any customers. Though. We didn't have no, we didn't get any revenue on this. And we spent a lot of time and morale uh, doing this. So, as in, we had a plan. We had very smart people involved. We had lots of uh, lots of. We won a lot of awards. We had uh, we had the press talking about us. We had uh, we had you know we had uh, we had external as in these are these are all startup guys who put money into companies, investors, all these things. And we had all that. But we still didn't get any customers or actual revenue or any any you know anything out of it. We had a great product. Uh, so what happened? The what happened was we built a product in isolation. We we built a product thinking that this is the market, right? and we had we thought the market was people who wanted to you know people in as in it was it was so disruptive everyone had to benefit from it. So we didn't really. We didn't really focus on a single market. We tried to do it for almost everyone we can think of initially, uh, but uh, eventually, uh, you know, people who, who were uh, who were attracted to it were uh, we found out that you know Samsung wanted to work with us, and LG, all these guys, all these component manufacturers want to work with us. And then we didn't even think that there was a market there, and that those relationships would take you know long time to materialize, and that was not really. What we were trying to do, we were trying to build the consumer class application that every design organization, whether it's hardware design to software design to business process consulting, can use. Uh, we want to be thought to be that disruptive, and we didn't therefore focus on a single market. Uh, therefore, uh, our product wasn't exactly right, and our message was confusing, and people didn't really understand what we were trying to do. And we actually didn't test it out this early on. Uh, so that we could actually figure out, okay, who is actually going to use this? How is it going to be used? Who is going to pay for it? Why is there a, there a benefit? <coughs> All these questions were asked relatively late. <coughs> so it was as in any other day you would just give up and walk away. Right? So, but uh, thankfully we didn't. As in we we thought you know, as in there's there's some value that we built. So what do we do? So interesting enough, when we are in this in, in the valley showing all this stuff to people and so on, so it's it it was a visual modeling, right? So you can draw stuff on it, 
and then we would put the intelligence on it and we'll show you notifications and all this stuff of you know how this works and we will <coughs> inject the magic to it. But people, most people were impressed by the fact that you could actually draw diagrams and stuff in the browser without installing Microsoft with you on the computer. And you can do this on, as in that's like a, in 2008 that was a huge technical achievement. As in we thought it was nothing much. Like, you know, because we had more amazing stuff that we have built because we were all techies and you know this is really cool. You should really see our technology and all our patent and stuff. But that's not what, what was, hey, can I draw a urinal diagram? This is great, can I use this for that? It's like, so we kept hearing this. And then we realized, okay, hold on, there's a there's value here that's much lower than what we anticipated, right? But there's value. People actually want to use it to draw diagrams. And nobody else is doing a good job of it. So, so what did we do? We, we, uh, we built it and we, we changed what we did and we came to, uh, came to this uh, level of uh, building company that's uh, Niagara. And uh, that has worked. So we've, we've built a company that's profitable and that's growing fast. And uh, that's, uh, that's really something, uh, considering that we are, technically we are not in the valley and we are, we are mostly based out of Sri Lanka. And uh, for us to have, uh, you know, Global brand brand recognition for us to have you know customers like from NASA to Cisco to uh, you know Amazon, Google, all these guys are using our product and it's it's, uh, it's it's really really something. But it all happened because we used our learning that we really screwed up early on. So we when we first launched our private beta of the product, it was really ugly. Uh, it was it was quite bad, and I remember. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandan was one of our first users, and he had given like you know, we had a five-star rating system on the product, and he had given six stars out of <laughs> out of five. It's amazing, and that sort of thing. So, as in, we got we got feedback very very early, uh, and the product was really ugly. It didn't work as it, well as we wanted it to work. But you know, we we were like, one day, let's put it out and see what people say, because that was our mantra. And we are we now we are now working on another product uh, around work management, and that's same thing that we're doing. You know, as in. It's ugly, but we use it. It's as in the fundamental things that differentiate. If it's working, it's working, right? And you don't have, need it to be really nice for somebody to try and use the value that you're trying to give. If it's good enough value, so let's talk about what happened. Uh, re revisiting what I just said earlier. So the reason that most startups fail are because of a few shadow beliefs that they think they know. We know what customers want, this is the first challenge, right? Uh, <coughs> so you, you never know, you have to actually ask. So that's why I said if you have an idea, just go and talk to some people who might be your customers. Do not ask your mother or your friends because they will always say, much a great idea, you know, you're so awesome, that sort of thing, but they're not your customers, they're not gonna give you money. So always go for a customer and try and get someone to pay for it because that's when it actually speaks, right? you know? Even 20 rupees doesn't matter. Ask them to say, you know, how much is it worth to you? Would you mind giving me 20 rupees so that I can give you the product three months later? You know, I'll give it three months for free, that sort of thing. And then you also think you can accurately predict the future that, you know, all these other companies will not do this. You know, I, I, I know they are not interested in this space. Uh, that sort of thing you will always think, you know, but you can't. So you have to constantly get out there and, and figure out what's happening. And also, you know, it's great to have a business plan, you need to do it, but you don't, you can't think that, you know, okay, we achieved so many things, they're so good. That's, that's not the case, right? That's never the case. Because you might be going on a plan to help, right? So it might be just, it's a wrong plan. Sorry. So your plan is never right because, again, if we go back to the definition of what a startup is, you're operating under extreme uncertainty. So, in creatively, what happened was, as we said, we listened to customers, we did a code, we dropped some people actually who were, who were using the product, and we, we carved out the uh, focus on diagramming, and we shipped too early, as we said, you know, embarrassing, but some people really liked it, the parts that actually worked, and we got revenue, profit, growth, all the other stuff that comes up. So uh, this is is a, is a 
models about how to do this, right? So there's this phrase as in uh, called uh, customer development, right? Is it's not product development, it's customer development. So uh, you know, Google this when you when you go home. Uh, it's a very important philosophy of how you actually build a product, right? So you first figure out uh, you you're first at a state where you don't as in you have to assume that you don't know the problem fully as well as you don't know the solution fully. Right? Then you're going go and actually figure out who are these people who have problem and then you figure out what these people uh, want and you know to, to build something, something small, and then you validate it with your customers, and then you figure out uh, you know so so if you if you look at it uh, figure out who the, who the customers are, you give them, give them a, a little bit of product and come back, as in, when you get there, get that feedback, come back, uh, do a little bit more, go back, talk to them. So you keep going here, and after that, you figure out, okay, so I have something that a kind of customer that I can define very well uh, wants, and then you go and uh, make, uh, make the rest of the, uh, rest that a population aware of your product, and you when you get to this level where you scale your company and, and do more things. So if you if you get here, that means you're you know you're really fortunate and you've done a very good job. So, but most people when you start off is is here. The thing is, when you start a startup, you go straight from here, skip this, go here, and then you think you're this. Right? So. That's the typical thing because we are all optimistic if you are when you are trying to be an entrepreneur. But it's not the case. So, so, uh, so what you're trying to do always is you're trying to minimize the time between the loops. So what happened for us is that we had a year in this loop, and that year was completely wasted. If we had cut it down to smaller, as we with creatively, what we did was we reduced the loop so that we got feedback very early on, and then we we fine tuned. But with the previous iteration of what, what we tried to do, we spent too much time trying to do So from an idea, you build something out, and you, uh, you know, the code is the outcome, and then you measure what the reaction for these from, the, from your customer base is, and you get some data out of it, saying, you know, this is how, how people uh, like it or don't like it or use it and so on, and then you feed back, feed back the learning into the, into the original idea, and then you work on product again. So in essence, that's what you need to do. So you need to build things in small batches. You need to test it with customers <coughs> and learn from it and incorporate the learning and build it again. So when I say build, it's not really product development only. It's about the entire entire organization, from, from marketing to product to support to everything. So uh, that's, that's in, a, in a nutshell uh, uh, how you do this, how you, how you execute a startup so that you don't fail, and uh, if you don't fail, you're probably heading towards success. So you should start now if you're working on startup. And I wish you all, all you guys, a uh, very best of success. Thank you. So, uh, I'll take a seat, and we'll take some questions at the very end because I think we're running, running short of time. Oh, I think when I said end, I meant the end of the presentation. Was oh, it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so just like, maybe like two questions. Yeah, yeah two questions. Well, then it's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> so, so the problem, as in, the customer doesn't know he has a problem because the customer is happy with what's there, right? Yeah. So your first step would be to educate the customer that there's a better way of doing things, right? Or the problem is not big enough for the customer to be bothered about. Maybe like, uh, customer don't understand the solution. Right? Then your solution is wrong. Then it's the PC also wrong. I'm sorry? PC. PC. Uh, like, Apple didn't do any research. People didn't want PC. And they put it. They yeah, so over time, and they knew. They, as in, they initially had, as in, Apple didn't. Apple was a <coughs> about $100 million company in a couple of years. Right? So obviously, they had a smaller segment of people who actually bought this stuff. Initially, they were hobbyists. So you can't say. The PC, as in PC, got mainstream after some time, but they initially had a large enough market.
to actually sustain a sustain a company. That's what it is. So even if you're doing a startup, you don't have to think about this billion dollar stuff, right? You're right now looking at a, you know achieving a hundred thousand rupee revenue. So you need to get that first. So if your you know per person revenue is about you know you know ten thousand rupees, you just need need ten people or like that to be your customers. Right? So that's sufficient. But when you as in, if you really think about it, it all depends on how big you want to go. Yeah. Uh, when you start building a startup or any company for that matter, so you have this group of people joining together at first, like co-founders maybe. So at, at a certain point, after some time, should they generalize themselves in all the tasks, or should they be specialized in a certain area that they can go with that? So initially, when you start, you you basically do everything, right? Yeah. You have to because nobody else is there to do this stuff, right? So, you know, as an initial when we started, we, we had people mopping and cleaning the, cleaning the toilets and doing all this stuff. We have to do it, right? After some time, when, when your time is worth spending on something else and you can <coughs> someone else to do that, they, they should specialize. But uh, as an as it's a natural process. As initially, uh, when you have a bunch of co-founders and you're working on stuff, somebody will and people will have to take initiative and do things. But after some time, if you have more team people in your team to work with, and those guys can take specialized roles, they uh, should. Okay. Yeah, they should. As in, uh, as in, you don't you don't need everybody doing everything. Then it's a it's a mess. So it's a it's a very natural process when you when you get into it. I'll take one more question, if guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Shantika, for that great presentation. Um, so moving along, our next speaker is Jayomi Lokulia. Jayomi has 12 years of experience in the industry and is the co-founder of and CEO of Z Messenger. Uh, Z Messenger is Sri Lanka's premier mobile media company and focuses on 360-degree mobile marketing campaigns, CRM solutions, branded community applications, and content distribution strategies. So Z Messenger services range from SMS gateway services to bulk SMS solutions and also mobile and web applications. So thank you, Jamie. That's one of the 
you guys. So uh, we have done hell of a lot of mistakes in our journey, entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I mean, uh, so what I'm going to do here basically to kind of reflect um, on what we should have done and what we could have done and also some of the things that we got it right. So in that way, I thought um, I could kind of pass down certain lessons, the hard lessons that we have learned during our 10 year journey, right? So, um, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of questions from the audience uh, and uh, this, uh, this component of uh, entrepreneurship, the idea, right? I mean, people were asking, how do I safeguard my idea? I mean, how do I measure it and so on. I mean, uh, now my feeling is, I have a different total, different opinion about the, the initial original idea because uh, in all the entrepreneurship lessons or the blogs that you have seen, the idea is given uh, too much of undue credit, right? Um, why I'm saying so? Because um, there are a lot of good examples of this initial idea have proven uh, uh, with uh, less value. Right. So the basically, sorry. I'm, so the, the, the first uh, kind of a trap or the delusion most of the entrepreneurs think. I mean, you you kind of go to the starting a company when you keep that light bulb moment. Right. Maybe you have this brilliant idea, and they think uh, the next thing, next uh, the next uh, step should be go on, go ahead and start executing your company. Right. That's the the first delusion. But um, I think, uh, I don't know that we have uh, any investors or venture capitalists here, but I think they know best. Say, if you go and um, tell them, hey, I have a brilliant idea, and uh, but before I share it, I want to sign an NDA, they say, go and buy a kite. I mean, um, that, that's the kind of a market value you get for an idea. And also, another example, um, if you look at uh, some of the big guys, the big names that I was mentioned here, um, like Microsoft. Microsoft's initial idea was, do you have any idea? <laughs> initial idea was basically to uh, make money by selling programming languages. And uh, IBM, if you take IBM, uh, their current uh, business model actually didn't occur to them until their earlier plan, plan was dropped out five years ago. And in my context, I, I, I told you I didn't get everything right. So uh, in my context, our original idea, actually three of us, we, we were believers of mobile. We knew mobile is going to be the next great channel, right, the third screen. But um, then how our, our business idea conceived was not mobile marketing. Actually, we want to start a mobile-based research company. I mean, how, how odd is that, right? And uh, it's partly because of him and me. Because we were the first, I mean, Janaki is from the research background, he was a research analyst before he started, and I, I was a marketing guy at a research company, right? So um, we kind of actually, but we have seen the problems these research guys are facing, like when they collect the data, it takes more than a month to tabulate and get the result. So by that the time, like if it's opinion poll, people's opinions would have changed, right, over one month. So, but then, we realized along the process that this is not going to get us where we wanted to go. The scope was limited, right? And uh, if you are working with local companies, you will see that uh, research budgets are the first thing to get cut off when, when the client faces a recession, right? So it was not at all a sustainable idea. So we just uh, basically detour and we landed on the mobile marketing. Um, and then, now, this is one of the main policies of the, the idea bias, right? And the second one, basically, is many entrepreneurs, they think, uh, when it comes to the initial <coughs> sales, right, they think it's kind of a second and a problem. And I still remember, um, even at Zee Messenger, uh, when we were doing our initial planning, we had a common go-to method, concept nursery. So a technology incubator, right? Um, we were all sitting down and then we had one of our friends, she was a consultant, uh, she, she came down from uh, Australia. And um, basically I can remember she was saying, your problem is like chicken and egg. 
our chicken and egg problem was basically, uh, I'll tell you what it is. It's like, uh, say, you want to get users to beat a test your product, right, before it becomes popular. That's the chicken problem, right? And the egg is basically, how do you make it good enough to become popular uh, before you have beta users, right? That's the chicken and egg. And similarly, with Zena Center, our chicken and egg was, um, so would you kind of use this database for your later on communications? Like, when you have a new offer, would you use this database to push out the messages? So it kind of made sense to them. They said, yeah, I mean, we have daily like thousands of people visiting our mall, but uh, when we want to kind of do a campaign, we go back to using mass media. But if we have these regular visitors, can we can directly get them to the <coughs> top owners, right? So that's how we solved it. And uh, in this, uh, I have an interesting uh, kind of a story to share, like one of the bloggers that we did. Uh, this was actually the very first campaign. And I had uh, two marketing guys, uh, one, of, uh, one of them related to me. So I think talent was another issue that I think some of the earlier speakers spoke about. But um, they went and, uh, I, I think you would have heard about Daily Market, right? It's no longer there. So, um, Daily Market was one of our uh, earlier clients. And uh, they also agreed to come on board with this subscriber acquisition and advertising campaign. But the client had uh, bigger expectations. The client said, look, I don't want you to just go and send um, SMS alerts about Daily Market. Instead, they asked us, do us a mobile coupon campaign and show how it works. So I was not there in the initial pitch. So, and they came and said, Jam, um, we agree. I said, really? Oh my god. And then the worst thing said, and then he said, that's another one more problem. I said, what is that? And they were saying, um, well, the client wants this offer. It's, it's going to be the happy hour. It's like 5 to 7. So she wants to send these messages before 5 o'clock. So five to hour, five to seven period, the people should come with the message and show the text and redeem the offer. I was like, oh my God! Now they have committed. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm just getting uh, me and Janaka. I remember we're trying to get our uh, operations team to do the campaign. So we kind of suggest uh, we thought, okay, if the people have to come there by five, then at least by three, three thirty, four o'clock, they should have the text right, so they have enough time to decide. And then. Uh, so we started broadcasting around 2.30. We thought that's like, it's not a, we didn't have a huge base, it's a small base. And this is where we kind of uh, hit our head on the board. Even at 4 o'clock, I still remember, not even 10% of the messages being broadcast. The system is stuck. It's not going. It's like, oh my god, what am I going to do now? It's like, it's, it's, we, I really thought this this the end of the messenger, you know. We are going to not kill the company, but we are going to like kill the entire SMS medium as a advertising channel. So the, the, the quick thinking came in. I mean, we had uh, about had 10 incubator companies in the concept nursery. So each company had two to three guys working. So it's about uh, roughly about 30, 40 guys. So he said, hey guys, uh, let's sit down to the market. Uh, we kind of stretched for this message. I said, Hey, uh, yeah, these are the people, so they were like showing the offer and giving <laughs> the voucher. So it's really funny, but the uh, client kind of, she was not at all happy. And the worst part was we only got our first advance, which was like less than 10% of sales value. And the balance sheet kind of said, no way, out. So that was the very first uh, bad experience, I mean, but we learned a lot. At least then we had a client to learn it, right? So that is one of the things I thought I'd share. Um, so my my entire, the focus of my presentation, I mean, not only the entrepreneurship, I'm going to look at entrepreneurship in a different angle. Because um, most of the entrepreneurs, they kind of fail to recognize the importance of salesmanship in a startup company. Because uh, various studies have proved Salesmanship is the central to a success of a, any young startup. And I'm not saying because I, I have some sales or marketing background, but uh, there's a lot of research done and a lot of interviews or service being done. So basically, as I come, this is what I think matters most. 
then you do your prototyping or considering your idea and that idea will set itself. No, this is what actually one of the very, very crucial thing in entrepreneurship, right? <coughs> so, um, yeah, uh, before I get there, I kind of would like to ask, I mean, though the salesmanship is very important, but a lot of entrepreneurs tend to ignore this part, right? They always think first sale is a chicken and egg, or they think the innovation is so superior, it will sell itself, right? So, why do you think like, um, why, why do you think it's because we have very less experience in selling, especially if it's taking us, it's like not much of exposure in the sales management. Um, can I see like how many of you have done your MBA? I don't think you know, most of the MSCs must be here, but uh, any of you have done your MBA? Not exactly, okay. I have done. And if you even you can go around checking the MBA curriculum, you will see, you will not find a single module on sales management. Why would, why is that? Any particular answer? Right? <coughs> so, so uh, is, uh, is sorry, yeah. sales management the same as marketing management? Basically? No, that's what I'm going to come at. <laughs> yes, actually sales is the step child of marketing. Right? Um, what I'm going to say, because probably in MBA, um, the, the general entry criteria is like experience one track record of industry experience. So that's where you kind of get in the MBA. So now to get that full one track record of experience, most of the people who get in there have proved that they can sell. So maybe that could be one of the reasons that MBA has been carried sales management model. And also, um, now if you see that's a big boom in the MBA uh, qualification itself. And with this boom actually the marketing as the discipline also rose, right, so they both coincided, so the marketing was given more preference because marketing was all about, hey, you do the good branding, good advertising, so you don't go and push sales, you cannot pull it, right? That is all about marketing. So the marketing got the new respect and whereas sales were, got actually little, very less respect. So that's why I said like sales became the stepchild of marketing. So maybe this, these are reasons, couple of reasons I could think of why sales was not uh, being uh, sent uh, even to the entrepreneurship because even with my MBA, I had on entrepreneurship as a subject and uh, where I had to speak a couple of times about Z Messenger and financial management, legal, but nothing on sales, right? So, um, other than this uh, sales function, I mean there's a global survey done talking to so many entrepreneurs of the kind of regrets that they have had uh, in their ventures, right? Uh, so one of the regrets basically is starting late. What, they, what, what is meant by starting late is like uh, they have fully developed their product and then only they have gone to the customers and realized there is a mistake. I think uh, Chandika also just spoke about the topic uh, um, and uh, <coughs> uh, Eric uh, Reeves, the Lean startup main philosophy is getting in front of the customer from day one when you conceive that idea, right? Not you first go and do the product and then go back to the customer, right? That's number one. So this is one of the regrets or the traps that they have fallen into. And second is I like this, is failing to validate. Um, failing to validate in the sense, uh, basically, most of the entrepreneurial lessons I've seen, when you conceive a good idea, just go and talk to your friends, family, and see what they say about it and so on. But uh, the funny thing, not only asking, we even try to go and sell it to the, our family and friends, right? And uh, the, the intention of buying is not the product quality. It's basically the soft motivation, something like out of love or maybe out of obligation, or probably it's like they feel really sorry for us, so kind of want to buy it, right? So um, now this is a trap because a lot of entrepreneurs say in re retrospect that they think uh, this kind of gives a sense of false validation, like why they kind of bought, bought my product, right? So this is a, another thing, but actually with Zee Messenger we didn't have that kind of uh, privilege to go and say it to our friends and family because we were kind of ostracized. 
don't come until you make money and you lost everything, you know, that was the attitude. So we, we didn't get into this trap, thank God. The third one, the deep discounts. And uh, see, not only like you have to go through this pain of building the product, then it's the, the selling part. And the selling part, customers can be sometimes very nasty or tricky. Say, when, when they see, okay, you are a new startup, new company, you come up with this great product, I mean, even acknowledging the product is good, but they kind of really try to take advantage of your vulnerability. I mean, they know you are so eager to make the first uh, sale, right? So they kind of say, hey, okay, offer me a good discount, I'll try it. Or give me, give it for free, I'll do it and see. So that's what. And most of the time, we kind of tend to offer these great discounts. And then, uh, the, the danger here, uh, it's called unification. The, in small industries, this news spreads very fast. So this kind of really endangers your later on pricing strategy because if you give free to one guy, you are a 80% discount, the next guy is going to ask, uh, why, did, why did you give that to me? So I, I mean the same. I mean, it has happened to even us. I still remember, I don't know how it goes, but the news goes up, right? So this is the second one and third one. And how you can counter is, um, the suggestion is basically you can look at other sweeteners to close the deal, not necessarily the discount, right? You can probably, if it's like a product company, you can give a free shipping. Or at the messenger, what we did, we kind of coupled with some other solutions. Say if it's SMS campaign, we kind of gave some complimentary email or something and just kind of ran it and give to the customer so that he wouldn't ask for the discount, right? So uh, you can just kind of think of different scenarios rather than, sorry, extending the discount. And this point is very important, but actually even myself or my partners, we have not thought about so much, is strategic bias. See, the idea is because you are so eager to make your first sales, and who would want to go and think when you have customers, are they strategic or not, right? I mean, you, when you are in that shoe, you will really know, you don't want to kind of world segment and say how big guy, how big this guy's pocket is and so on. But if you have that privilege to identify strategic bias, what I meant by strategic bias is uh, the people who can give you feedback in your prototyping and then they can give you referrals and also ensure repeat business. I mean, those are strategic bias that you need to focus on. Um, I'll tell you later on some of the examples so that how we have done it so that at least uh, we kind of ensured we had a couple of key strategic buyers in the messenger box. And the next term, behavioral <coughs> sales. This is basically when you really go and make your first sales call or the first sales meeting. You are going to get a lot of objections. There's no way you can escape it, but you get objections. So by understanding, then you, you will know how to kind of deploy uh, how to handle these objections, right? The first one, efficacy. Say so when you are a new startup, uh, when you have new product or service, like customers kind of tend to look at it a lot of skepticism, right? I mean, how exactly are you going to add value <coughs> to my task? And in our context, when you said, hey, look, uh, mobile is going to be the next screen for targeted communication, they were like, uh, oh, really? Uh, and this was, by the way, this was in 2004 or three that era. And um, if you have not kind of can't uh, recollect, SMS was a value-added feature. That means you had to kind of pay to get that feature on, like CLI, right? So they were saying, are you sure, like, uh, what exactly can you do with the small black screen with 160 characters, you know? I mean, email must be quite a good bet than this SMS. So that's kind of a skepticism they had on this video. So how we had to basically, uh, I mean, we didn't dare to go and promote this medium to large companies like Unilever. Because Unilever might say, okay, come on, my market is mass market. And on top of that, uh, the phone has a Roman uh, keyboard, right? So my people can't even like uh, type in English. Because they thought this is supposed to be typed in English. That's the other assumption they had. So we dare not to go and convince them. But instead, we looked at other clients like, or like very niche oriented brands so that they sh saw the value because their market was specific. They had that kind of affluent uh, crowd and this medium fit <coughs> them very nicely. So we kind of focused mobile marketing, if it's SMS broadcasting to that market, while 
that um, big guys like Unilever, we didn't drop them out. We turned the other side and we said, look, use this medium as a complementary tool to your traditional advertising. I mean, don't use it to um, communicate that the signal is giving, uh, you know, bright smiles or don't do that, you know. It's but use it when you run this, uh, write a postcard, that rally anyone like that kind of campaign. She said, don't do that. People don't want to take that all the pain and go to the post office and post it, you know. Just uh, put a co or coupon so that they will text in to win something. So that's how we kind of got both parties involved, right? Then um, credibility. I like this part because I'm um, being the only female representation in Sina Center and I was doing the marketing. I was facing this problem a lot because credibility is basically when you are a young company, the client always look at who are the co-founders, right? And most of the time when I go for the sales pitch, they say, oh, okay, good. And they said, uh, who are the co-founders? Uh, then I'm like, um, okay, I'm one. Oh, really? <laughs> and then like, yes, uh, okay, so are you are you having a like, tech experience? You must be great tech. I'm like, well, no, it's like I'm from Mark. And then, oh, so that, that kind of uh, gives the total picture and he goes to a different mode, right? But credibility is something that really matters because that's how they kind of judge you, right? They always want to know who's behind this. And how you can tackle, because uh, say me and Jonathan, when we started, we had less than three years of executive experience. And only though she had about six years, uh, and he was anyway uh, heading an R&D team about 30 people. So at least he had some credentials, but me and Jeff, we didn't have much. So the best thing to handle, basically actually you can talk along some people with solid industry experience. I mean, we did the same thing. We kind of got um, people appointed that advisory board members to our senior center board. So at least we can show their pictures, though they are not physically, these people are there, you know. So that's how we kind of tackle the problem. And um, third one, the size. Yeah, most of the startups, if you're a local startup, your size is not going to be more than 10, right? And another thing, the customers feel, they don't feel comfortable when your company is small. They are like, anytime you can close and just disappear, right? That's the other question. <coughs> but how you can handle, again, you can get clients to focus on the merits of the size, right? Now, we did the same because when we started the messenger, um, the mobile operators, the big guys, they thought, hey, this is mobile, is our space. I mean, we can't let this kind of guys do marketing. This is, belongs to us. So they also launched the mobile marketing platform. Wow, now it's like a, a head-on competition and with big guys. So, And they were going to our clients, like especially the media stations, because you must be knowing that we provide the back end, this voting platforms to 90% of the country's media stations. So they went and said, okay, I mean, we are this company, have this kind of capacity so we'll build the platform. But then how we kind of tried to win the client was we said look we are not going to come and just install a box in your media TV station. Instead we will even help you how to do this um, SMS or generating uh, TV formats. We kind of give some consultancy right and, uh, and even if they don't know how to handle this entire SMS polling and show it on the screen we even sent one of our tech guys to support the studio stuff. So in that way, I mean the, the big players, they, they couldn't uh, afford to hire another guy only to do this because it's just not their core, so they want to get in. So this is another way, I mean, how we kind of tackle like getting the client to focus on the merits of being small. And then finally, I think I spoke about this earlier, the price and the switching cost. So um, basically, as I said earlier, I mean, this can really ruin your pricing strategy. So how do you kind of tackle it? By looking at customers who are willing to pay the price you quote, or if you think the price that you're offering is fair enough, then probably you're not good at uh, articulating your value proposition, right? So what we did, when we feel like it's something like that, we kind of want to go back and then kind of revamp our pitch and then go back and say, okay, this is exactly why I'm asking this price for is the value add, this product will deliver. I mean, those are the tactics that you can definitely use. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I was talking about validating ideas. 
all these things uh, kind of I said out of the experience or how when I reflected on the past uh, our track record. But uh, so just to update my idea, I was like trying to kind of do some research since uh, I thought this forum is, I mean, quite intellectually stimulated forum, so I should give some kind of a framework, right? Um, and uh, luckily I found one. I should give you credit to uh, HBR. Uh, it's about uh, entrepreneurs uh, friendly sales framework. Because, uh, say, I, as I said, if you don't have enough sales experience, if you, are, if you are trying to get it by reading existing books or blogs, it's not going to help you much. What I'm saying is that because most of the sales material are written for large established companies, right? It's not in the startup context. And I always found it very difficult to kind of absorb what they are suggesting. And, um, but this model basically talks about two phases as idea generation and execution. So here, again aligning uh, to the Lean Startup philosophy, it tells basically first when you come with the idea, share it with your prospects, get their feedback, refine it, and then you will have the revised idea. And what you do, not to go to execute, but you need to kind of again share it with the prospects and see whether that idea is worth executing or whether that idea is not good enough but you still can go and revise it or it's a total crap, crappy idea. So you drop it off so that you can really shorten that uh, entire R&D process, right? And then prototype. And the next one, uh, the execution, basically, the, the idea here is, in the execution uh, phase, the prototyping, you get your client involved into the process. Now, uh, the, the one thing I didn't tell, see Messenger, in, uh, in the eighth year, we actually ventured into uh, mobile apps <coughs> in SC Payment Solutions. But that's not under see Messenger brand name, that is under Auric. So, Janaki is right now uh, actively running it, whereas I kind of look up with see Messenger. So in, in Auric, because that's not like Siemens and is a very investment heavy uh, company, the infrastructure cost a lot. So how we did was, so we didn't go to angel investors, right? Um, we kind of partnered with a prospective client uh, because we are trying to launch this uh, transportation, uh, NFC payment system for transportation and then another social beneficiary card, the same platform. So there we kind of partnered with uh, uh, the, these clients, like if it's transportation, we uh, partner with the transport, like the bus owners, and then uh, another telco, so that they were also involved from the prototyping stage onwards. And the benefit here, once they are involved, see the research has shown when people are involved from that initial stage, the odds are high that they will at the end buy your product, right? So same thing happened with Auric. I mean, now uh, we, we have commitment from those clients. Once the piloting is over, they are going to ramp up and they are going to basically buy a solution and we are, we kind of know what kind of revenue is going to bring in. So that's another kind of a strategy um, that we can really work on. So I'm kind of closing to the last slides. Yeah. And uh, other than my sales theory, uh, basically there are some more challenges as entrepreneurs you might face like um, the marketing budget. I heard somebody was talking about marketing budget. The funny thing, if you ask e Messenger, I think uh, for the last six years we didn't have any allocation as marketing in our uh, annual budget, right? And then you must kind of think what exactly I'm talking. I'm being a marketer, the worst thing, right? No, actually, uh, we kind of dependent, we kind of relied on certain strategies that didn't uh, basically put us into this uncomfortable situation of getting the agencies briefing them, no. What we did was, uh, one strategy we used, we had media stations at plant. So we kind of worked out this uh, semi contract use. Half of the service they pay, half of the service they kind of give it on contract so that we could kind of publish our services or communicate. Um, the other thing, uh, I think Chandikos had done this right, uh, getting awards. I mean, for us, actually, it's totally out of coincidence and we didn't plan it. But even um, we kind of won uh, Spring Brand Excellence Innovative Brand of the Year back in 2005. Then got a recommended medal from the GSM Association. 
for using mobile for emergency because uh, 2005 general elections we cleaned up peferal and we ran a mobile election monitoring system. Wow. So, uh, and those campaigns really got the highlight. I mean, that's how kind of a zero budget marketing happened for us. And uh, second thing, the competition. As someone said uh, very correctly, when you conceive the idea, the same idea being conceived about another thousands of people. So, from the day one, we had competition with the big guys. And then later on, the small mushroomed up uh, mobile marketing and blah, blah, blah. But uh, the differentiator matters, how exactly you're going to differentiate, <coughs> and the timing. Because right now, my company, we are working on a deal aggregating platform, right? Uh, soon it's going to uh, German launch it uh, officially. But at the same time, when we are developing, about another three companies, I saw press articles, um, something similar, but not the exact thing being launched. So the timing matters a lot, right? It's like how fast you can get the market. And then um, repeat customers. Now this is one of the biggest pains I know that like whoever has started the company, they might say, look, every day I have to go and hunt down customers. You know, it's like daily fluctuations. I mean, last month I made this much, but this month my sales have come down. It's like total hunting. But later on, I'm not suggesting this at the initial phase. But later on, you can really analyze your business model, the revenue generating model, and see how you can go to the farming level. Farming in the sense, how you can have a bunch of customers who will give you a X number of revenue throughout. So in that way, you can really leverage on your other efforts and acquire more customers. So this is, I think, uh, yeah, I have covered about 99%. The 1% is left. Yeah. Yes, um, there's an interesting thought I want to basically communicate tonight to leave you with. Um, have you wondered how many serial entrepreneurs are there in the society right now? Um, when I say serial entrepreneurs, like I'm talking about people like Bill, uh, Steve Jobs, Richard Branson. So maybe they represent a tiny majority, maybe 1% of the population, right? So the idea is, um, say, uh, nothing will be achieved, a little will be achieved uh, without talent, right? I, I hope you always make it is achieved without talent. And uh, nothing will be achieved without hard work. So talent and the hard work are the <coughs> components. But unfortunately, these two alone will not get you to be successful in certain industries. I'm not telling everywhere. So plumber, engineer, yes, maybe. But sadly, entrepreneurship and then the financial markets, this talent and the hard work is not always yield the results you want. So then what am I going to say? You might wonder, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, if my lecture of there being there, uh, Dr. Travis Pereira from PIM, he might really disagree with what I'm going to say, but he was telling there's some parts thing called luck or something. I'm not going to say luck is going to play a part. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes uh, the what kind of a business boat that you get into matters more than how efficiently you grow the boat. So this is my theory. Uh, it's basically what I'm trying to say. Certain industries, the type of the business you get into kind of could be a main determinant to your success. Right? So I'd like to leave you with that thought. Nice saying by Warren Buffett, <coughs> saying the boat matters more than the road. So thank you very much. So was it uh, helpful that you were the first in the business? Um, yes and no, right? Uh, why I said yes was um, basically since you were the first in the business, we could kind of define the standards, right? Define the boundaries. And uh, also kind of had the chance to really go and do some R&D before others got into the market. Um, the other thing is like when you're the first in the market, sometimes uh, the road is really tough. I mean, you have to really kind of do a lot of hard work. It's like, for us, it's like actually creating a need.
that that uh, kind of a thing that we uh, people are trying to solve, you know. So yeah, we have both sides. Uh, what you are doing differently now when you approach a new customer than you did 10 years back? Um, doing different. As I said, we always reflect on what we have done wrong and trying to get the learnings. Uh, now I can tell you with our uh, new uh, venture, Auric, I mean, we didn't, um, one of the things, we were not relying on the angel investors. Now somebody was asking what angel investors or within the investment. But I believe your initial sale should be your first funding uh, mode. Because there's nothing more convincing than you having initial sale and then going to the investor rather than not having anything and going and pitching him, right? So uh, how we do it differently right now, actually we always try to find a partner. We kind of share the idea when it comes to the mobile payments. It's not that we even can say, hey, uh, we have this kind of product that we kind of deployed in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. So here it is, give it to the railway and say, execute it. No. It's basically, we kind of try to identify who are the main uh, players in this market. You know, if it's transportation, definitely the, the bus owners comes to keep input, right? Without their buying, you can't execute something like that. Then, okay, we had to kind of get, you know, get into this industry dynamics and the operators were then being patient. So what we did was we nicely kind of uh, suggested the idea, got their advice, and got them to part. Even right now, I mean, Janaka basically have even the bus owners. I mean, they have become a big contributor in developing this uh, NFC-based uh, payment platform for the transportation industry. I mean, how amazing is that? Otherwise, uh, it'll end up like that Dambulla uh, vegetable basket thing. You know, they might say, "Make a the bag." Thank you, Jeremy, for the wonderful presentation. Um, the final presentation for tonight will be by Dr. Ramesh Ranavanan. Uh, Ramesh is the, CT, is the Chief Technical Officer and Co-Founder at SimCentric Technologies. Uh, SimCentric has offices in Australia and the UK and specializes in advanced simulation add-ons training simulations and behavior control modules. Uh, Ramesh previously, previously worked at, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Interbox, <laughs> as a computer scientist and as a background in simulation and artificial intelligence. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you.
practical problems instead of coming up with theoretical research, which the world still really needs. But what, what the world is changing now is that a certain proportion of those people, like this proportion of the good people, are now going into the commercial sector and trying to start their own companies instead of going into, uh, instead of going into academia. So the main difference is that over the last 10, 15 years, it's been a huge rise in the number of PhDs. Uh, China produces 40% more PhDs per year over the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, there have been, there have been about three or four times doubling in the number of PhDs that are produced every year. And the question, of course, is what do all these people do? And as you can see, this is just some stuff I got from uh, Newsweek. And as you can see, the number of PhDs over, over the years has risen quite exponentially. And for the number of time to complete, it's the same, but due to funding constraints, due to the cost of education, everything, the number of jobs available for these PhDs within academia have dropped drastically. As you can see, the number of full-time jobs, full-time academic jobs, has almost halved over the last 15 years. Uh, what you have is a rise in the number of postdoc opportunities, which is just one or two year research opportunities after you after you finish your PhD. Uh, but that's just a couple of years, and then you still got to find a job after that. Uh, and then you got part time jobs. But basically, you have more people getting PhDs, masters, but less number of jobs available in academia. And this is because uh, governments are now spending less money on on universities. Uh, and also less money on research. So the top universities around the world have to figure out ways to generate money so that they can keep those same standards that they've been maintaining for years. Right. So basically the main difference that I've, as a person who worked in both academia and uh, commercial, uh, commercial operations, the main difference I see with commercial research, or what they call research in companies, uh, I'm talking about companies like Pfizer, Glaxo, you know, the top multinational companies, where they first come up with a problem, and then they hire all the people possible to try and solve that problem. So they always start with something that's defined, and they try to come up with different ways that they can solve it. Whereas in academic research, it always starts with somebody coming up with a cool idea, or something that they're related to, and they try to prove that the hypothesis works. But then the moment they develop the model, I'm talking 99% of the time, that's where the buck stops. They write the research paper, they publish it, and then pure theoretical research is what the world needs. The world is at where it is now because of pure theoretical research. But where a lot of academics have fallen short is that going into business or coming into startup, say I'm talking about the 80s and 90s, there's always look down upon where if you if you do a PhD and if you go into starting your own company or you join the private sector. The type of stuff that you will do will be so demeaning that you will always be looked down upon the research community. And it was usually the people who couldn't get jobs in the top universities, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, whatever, that would go and join a company and very few of the good guys to go. But now, this has really changed. At the time that I was in university, the guys who would get the best PhDs, the guys who would get, you know, do really groundbreaking research, right from the time they start their PhD, the number one thing they're going to talk about is what they're going to do after they finish their PhD, and that would always, more often than not, be starting a company. I would go for lunch with with my colleagues, and the only thing that each guy is talking about is business ideas. I want to start this, I want to start that, and this was a huge difference to, from the time I started to the time I actually finished and came back to Sri Lanka, and I'll walk you through those reasons. So, the main reason is that the main universities in the world used to earn a lot of their external money through patent licensing. University would do some research, they would get a patent, and then they would go and license the patent to some company, Glaxo, Microsoft, Google, whoever. And uh, they would get some money annually based on sales. But this, this model that universities use has been an absolute failure. If you take the top 400 universities in the world, 50% of the total patenting income that the universities around the world have had has been only earned by 5% of those universities. The other remaining 95% of universities earn almost nothing because the patenting method, the way they license it, the way their patenting license schemes are structured are all different. 10% took 70% of the income. So the remaining 90% basically couldn't even cover the administrative cost to maintain and give the patents with the amount of money that they were earning. Uh, so because of this, the universities suddenly realized that if they were to be competitive, they have to come up with a different model on how to make or not make money, which is where the whole startup idea is coming. So, so most 
universities now work on a model called the nurturing startup model. The main thing that they do is they try to foster their own startups. Instead of taking their own licenses and taking their patents and giving it to somebody else as a license, what they try to do is uh, they try to give it to a company owned by the university itself to try and make some money out of it. And the way they do that is that they try to devote a huge number of uh, university resources to fostering the startup. And what they do is, right from the start, the university, as I was at, first year undergraduates, second year undergraduates, third year undergraduates, right from the start, a core component of their course is always entrepreneurship, is business management. Guys who learn chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, whatever. These guys are always taught entrepreneurship right at the start. And right from that point, they start thinking about what entrepreneurship is about. And it's no longer thought of as being a demeaning aspect. Basically, it's the... the so, what these universities do is, they, they devote a huge number of university resources to entrepreneurs. They introduce a lot of career incentives to get these entrepreneurs to start. And also, they partner with local business incubators and uh, capital investors, VCs, private equity firms and stuff to try and help these guys start off their companies. So, and also, many, many universities around the world now have, now have dedicated institutes which do only this. So, what are the problems that may, most universities have with the startup budget? Number one, academics are rarely business minded. They, they come to the problem, they solve it, and they think that's done and they move on. Whereas now what the universities are trying to teach guys is that solving a problem, coming up with a prototype, is only about 10 to 15% of the actual work done. It's still about 85% of work done before you can actually move on and start a company with it. Uh, they obtain funding for initial setup costs, they pay for patenting, stuff like that. So the university was I was at, uh, side business school, we they had an amazing model where we start, started off at about the time that I was there. Where the university has about 30 or 40 companies being started by the university every year. And the way they do that is, if you have a good idea, and if you, if you can be marketed, I'll tell you the selection process. But basically what the university does is it provides all the startup costs. It pays for patents. Patents, as you may know, especially international patents, it's very expensive. Uh, it can, if you get an international patent, it can cost him going to millions of dollars or millions of pounds. So all patent costs are made by the university advice and mentoring is provided, everything. And then, the way the university system works is that the, the people, the students who start the company are given 90% of ownership of the company for the first two years. So basically, the, those students have two years to bring the company up to profitability and then they can earn 90% of what the, what, the university, what, what the company actually earns. With the next two years, this guy gets 50% and then after, after four years, the university retains 90% of the ownership. Now this is an amazing system because it gets these guys off the board, it gets these guys some money, gives them the experience, and the experience to start a company with enormous backing. The best the best VCs, the best private equity firms, everybody to come and help them to start these, start these ventures. And based on this model, the university now produces about 30, 40, 50 companies a year. And each one of these are extremely high-tech companies new drugs, uh, new cancer drugs, new uh, scanning technologies, new types of materials for which are used on jets, which are used on, which are used uh, in space, whatever. But it's basically because of this, and because of this, everybody wants to start a company through the university. Every single student, so like I said, only 30 or 40, but the university puts out about 3,000, sorry, about 1,000 PhDs a year, of which about 100 of them are thinking about starting companies. But the remaining 60%, the moment they leave university, they immediately want to start a company as well. Because right on the start point, they are thinking along the lines as well. So what has changed? Basically, academics right from the start, now most of the academics that we have in universities are taught to think of applications for theoretical things that they do at the same time that they develop theoretical models. Right at the start, even when we used to go for practical exams, Sorry for theory exam. The lecturers ask us, right, you, you develop this theory, what can you do with it? What are the practical applications? And right from the start, everybody has to start thinking about, I know this, what can you do with this in the real world? And that's always the question. Entrepreneurship training and mentoring is provided. 
and also academics, mainly academics, are taught that a good idea is only worth about 10 to 15 percent of the job. The rest is a totally different volume. You may be technical, you may be a brilliant physicist, chemist, biologist, whatever, but just having that idea is useless. You've got to know how to execute it, and that what you have already have is only a very, very small percentage of what you need to make that into a company and execute it. <coughs> so, most of the people that I have that are, are follow up on some experiences are, I, are the most practical people I know. I've known, I've known physicists, chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, and statisticians who just go out into the world and they're analyzing everything. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll go into a couple of examples as, as we go along. But so just look at, so I'm going to start off with a really good example of something that I, I personally was involved in. And this, this is a, one of the most remarkable entrepreneurship stories that, that I know. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine <coughs> in university. He was doing a, he was doing a PhD in, uh, in physics where he was using cellular automata and statistics. To, to, to solve some problems in physics, to solve some gravity problems. And this guy was amazing in statistics. But every time you go into a restaurant, you to solve it. And one day, he was, he, was at a, he was at a pub. He was having a, a beer with a couple of friends, and there was a guy seated next to him. He said that you, you buy, you buy, either you buy a plane, or you buy a percentage of a plane, and you hand it over to this company, and this company would manage this airplane for you. So if I am in Sri Lanka, I have a share of a plane, I want a Gulf Fire, I call the company and say, please send a plane over, a Gulf Fire. They will send a Gulf Fire to Sri Lanka for me to fly to, fly to Bangkok. Right? And like that, they have this fleet of 4,000 planes which are continuously flying around the world, picking people up, dropping them in another place. And <coughs> they were telling us that, he had told my friend, that the biggest problem they had, or the biggest cost for their company, was this thing called shuttling flights. Let's say I'm in Sri Lanka. I want to fly to Singapore and I want a Gulf fight. So they got to get a Gulf fight from the closest location, bring it over to my place, bring it over to Sri Lanka, and that flight obviously costs money. You got to pay for the pilot, you got to pay for the uh, fuel, airport charges, whatever. And they said that about 48% of more, all their flights were all these shuttling flights. And that was a huge cost. Now, this company has been in operation for 15 years. And as you know, all flights, the way people move, the way things happen, all happening according to patterns. There are patterns. There's a Grand Prix somewhere, there's a good chance that there's going to be more flights in and out of that, that particular location. So on and so forth. So what my friend said was, do you have data? He said, yes. How much data can you give me? He said, I can give you 10 years of data. And immediately, he got this data. No names, nothing, just this flight went from this place to this place, this type of plane. And he came back to the university. He talked to me and a friend of mine. Uh, actually, the guy I started the company with. Uh, and he said, at this idea, what do you think? Can we do something? We said, fine. This guy went out, got a loan of 100,000 pounds or something. This is my friend. And he came back and said, right, I'm going to hire you guys for three months. He paid us 25,000 pounds, which at the time we were students was amazing. He thought that was brilliant. And we said, fine. We sat down, sat down for three months. And we wrote this statistical prediction system where we mine this data, and at any point, we would come up with a statistical prediction on where the flight should take off and take off from. So basically, if a flight goes and lands in Paris, we would come up with a prediction on whether we should leave that flight there or send it to another place. Things that nobody even thought of. The moment we, and we, we built that using hidden Markov models, genetic algorithms, it's just a prediction system. As far as mathematics goes, it's simple as you get. You have a variance, you build it, you get addition, we decide whether to send the plane somewhere or not, and that's it. And, and that's it. And this, this for me, is one of the most remarkable stories I've heard because he took a risk. But he had the confidence in his ability and his knowledge. And also, he was a PhD student at Oxford. So he could go to this company and say, I'm really good at statistics. Give me this job. I can do this for you. And that's where the credibility factor comes in. Having that educational background behind you to be able to do that is a huge plus. It's only a plus. It's not a prerequisite. But it's a huge plus to have that. So then. This is something that I, I personally worked on as well. Once again, <coughs> with that earlier project, we were students, so all we earned was that 25,000 25, pounds. This guy earned 50 million pounds, which we didn't, which we didn't get again. <laughs> but for us at the time, 25,000 pounds was more than I was getting from the university on my, on my grant or whatever, so we were, we were happy. This 
was my first job after university, where we, I once again worked for the university and we worked on cancer research. And what we were doing was, once again, this was an instance where I was able to go into a pre-existing industry and using my knowledge, which I had done for my PhD, my studies, whatever, I was able to change the way this whole, whole thing worked. And what, just to give you a background, this is a conceptual representation of a protein. <coughs> protein is a 3D structure with lots of molecules here and there. And <coughs> everything in our body from the sweating to skin growth to everything works with the protein. There are millions of proteins floating around the body. And proteins have a particular shape. If the shape changes, it does something else. So for example, cell division for cancer, uh, there are particular proteins which when they get a certain shape, the cells start to divide. So basically what you can do is you can try and block the cell from the protein from changing shape, which can then stop the cell from dividing, which can stop the cancer from spreading. And the way it works is you try to poke a small molecule in the middle here uh, to try and prevent it from turning. But it's got to have the correct interactions so that the, the protein doesn't assume the shape that it should be in. <coughs> and this is basically the drug. This, this is what goes into, goes into a pill. So what, what normally they used to do is that, number one, in the industry, they used to take this protein and just hundreds and hundreds of researchers used to take chemical compounds and keep dropping it into petri dishes and see if something happens. But once again, even if you have a thousand researchers working over a year, you can probably test about, you can probably test about, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 compounds, which is nowhere near enough what you need. Whereas my university, the difference was that they had a, they had a database of, <coughs> for a, of 40 million compounds. Basically, they have the chemical definition of this, this particular ligand or that compound. <coughs> and then using that, what the university used to do was they used to take this individual protein, take each, each um, compound that they had in the database and evaluate it against the protein to see if they can get it to change its shape. And then, basically you have to screen 40, 40, million, 40 million compounds. Single compound usually takes about half an hour to screen. So even then, you know, she had a cluster of a thousand pieces, and to screen the whole database of 40 million compounds used to take about a two-month processing run. But still, they used to do it, and then they run the run the screening test. They try to find the 10 best molecules, which are possible. Sorry, the 50 best molecules which are possible drugs, and then that 50 is sent into a lab, which might eventually be turned into a, into a drug. But once again, the fact that this cluster of 1,000 computers still took two months to do basically meant that they could only do six proteins a year, which was a huge inhibiting factor. I joined this company once the system was built, and we, we went and basically what I did was I changed this whole search algorithm to use hidden marker models, genetic algorithms, uh, hill searching, whatever. And we were able to, once again, using what I had done for my PhD, we were able to reduce that uh, processing time by a single ligand could be could be evaluated in one second, and we were able to we were able to change the system so that the entire database of 40 million molecules could be evaluated in one day compared to two months. Now this system, I I I was given I was given shares of the company at that time, and once again one of these bad decisions that I I made along the way. And right at the time I delivered this system, I decided to come back to Sri Lanka and start this company. So I sold off my shares and came back. But this company now has been sold last year for 500 million dollars, uh, 500 million pounds. And it was mainly based on this change that we made. Now once again, I was able to identify what could be done and what are the possibilities because of what I knew of the knowledge that I was able to bring in. And I was able to execute it myself. This is what I do now, which is uh, we do what's called simulations training. We, once again, this, this is a, another story of how we will use what we do. Uh, we build games. We build games, but what are called serious games. We build games of training where people can play our games and train themselves for real world, real world situations. And <coughs> once again, this, this company I started with uh, my friend, the initial friend of mine who worked on that airline system. Uh, we started this company together. This was one of those very, very unique companies that we started and the actual path that we took to where we are now has been very, very different to pretty much every single story that you've heard up to this point. We, 
we initially started with the two of us working in our houses. We, we spent a couple of months here with a small prototype. Then we took it to the Australian government. They liked it. They gave us a grant, which basically paid our salaries for one year, my, mine and my friends. And then using that money, we came back to Sri Lanka and we hired uh, three guys. One, one, of, one of whom is here. We hired three guys. And uh, with that money, we were able to develop the two to about ten after one year. But once again, we, had, we used that money that we got as a grant. We, dealer, we delivered it to our customers. And then, but the deal that we struck, we were very smart with that. We said that we'll develop this on contract for you, but we want to retain the intellectual property of what we built for you. And the moment we delivered it, we went and sold it to lots and lots of other people. The US government, the British government, the Canadians, Australians, Kiwis, everybody knows it was software. But uh, now we've grown to a company of about 110 people. But once again, we were really lucky about this stuff. We were in the right place at the right time. And we have the credibility once again to go to the Australian government and say, we can do this. This is what we can do. And up to this point, both of us retained 100% ownership of the company, which, which once again is just about being in the right place at the right time. And up to this point, and this is one of the new products that we've been developing. And this once again is one of those very interesting stories where we, we went to the, and pretty much all the money that we've earned up to this point have been come from two coming two ways. First way is that we, do, we sell this software that we build as commercial software products. But the rest of the money that we earn is on contracted work. But we, we are yet to bid for a contract. Every single job that we've done has been on, on unsolicited proposals, where we come up with a cool idea, and we go and show it to the Australian government, the British government, the US government, and say, right, we can do this. We want us to do it. Up to this point, we haven't been rejected on a single unsolicited proposal that we have taken to them. And this is a once again an unsolicited proposal that we gave to Boeing, a Boeing company who makes aeroplanes. They went and said they, they were looking for a trainer, they wanted they wanted a solution where they could inject people into their simulations. Uh, an out of the box solution where you could just give any terrain, bang, and you can have people walking around to make it more realistic. This took us about three years, four years. Yeah, it took us about four years, but we finally delivered it. And now we own the product and we are about to launch it. And already the US government has bought this software. US, US government uses simulations usually, they use it for almost everything. And this was like almost a perfect solution. But once again, I just want to highlight the different business model that we have. But the, the biggest plus that we had so far has been the credibility, has, has been you know our background and also our track record, the fact that we delivered our products. And because of that, we've basically been able to build a very unique company by well, basically with, with our own money to a level where we haven't been, we haven't had to go to VCs or private which ones are able to get, to get that work done. Right. So overall, what's the take home message? Education. Education no longer is an avenue to go into academia, teaching or research. Education now is thought of as more as being an avenue to get into entrepreneurship and startups than ever before. If you actually take the hierarchy of people, I did my PhD with the really, really good people, the guys who did amazing PhDs, the Rhodes scholars, the Camden scholars, whoever, pretty much all of them are running their own companies. Whereas the guys who were self-funded or came with, you know, working at, were working at Sainsbury's and some were making sure that they were able to pay their fees, those are the guys who are paying, working for us. So the, the top run guys are all now entrepreneurs. They are all running their own companies. So basically education now, is a path into entrepreneurship. It's a, it's a serious path. And most of the really, really top people are going into are going into entrepreneurship, starting their companies, generating amazing ideas. Some of the companies that I've seen, some of my friends come up with have been have been phenomenal. Uh, from physics to chemistry to statistics to whatever. And more and more of the disruptive technologies are being developed by these large scientists. And eventually, I mean it's very rarely that Scientists take a company right to the end, they usually look for an exit at some point. Because after a certain point, as you all know, most companies become more about management after a certain point rather than your actual technical skills. But they just move on. The, the friend I told you who earned, uh, who earned $50 million, he, last year, I know he earned $200 million. He owns his own claim now from that same company, which is managed by the same company. Uh, but once again, this is, this is what is clear. There's a guy with a physics PhD. Who, who was working in <coughs> cellular automata, which is the most random thing measurable in the world. But
But yeah, that's the way the world is. Again, and uh, I just want to stress on the fact that you you really have to market yourself well. And the better you are, the more credible you are, the more knowledge you have, the more credibility you will have when talking to VCs, when talking to this thing. And also, it also helps you generate ideas. And like us, every single product that I've worked on at this point has been a niche product. I've been working on products which nobody else in the world is working on. And that's that's an amazing thing to be able to do. But being gen to generate those ideas, you usually have to have some sort of background to be able to, to get that idea. And yeah, and that's for it. Uh, any questions? If you do start a startup, right, and you know, like now you you started up, and now you're looking for good people, right? Like, say, a good marketing person or a good salesperson, whoever. What do you do when everyone's you know, adopting the attitude of "I want to start my own thing," where you know I'd much rather do my own thing than work but for that's someone else? Not everybody wants to start their own thing. But if all the good people do, yes. Uh, I mean, it's like this now. For us, as, as a company, we, we never hired our own salespeople. We went on a different model. We, we use uh, resellers from the start. But me and my partner, right from the start, realized that we are not salespeople. We are, I mean, me, I'm a scientist. I really can't go to a customer and see what the customer wants. I've never been able to do that. So right from the start, we used resellers. So that's, we realized what our drawbacks were, both of us as scientists, and realized that if we do our own sales, they're going to miss it up. So we, we went and so every single country we sell to, we use resellers. We have companies which are a pretty decent percentage, but for us, it was it was better. But what you what what you ask is good question. I mean, it's like this: there there is a finite number of companies which can be started in the world, based on funding, based on availability, based on person, and there are always good people you can hire. There are always good people, and once again, and retention is once again looking for once you find a good person, you got to figure out ways to keep that. Because the moment you know that he, he or she is good, there's always a chance that the person will be as well good as somebody else as well. But, like you said, finding good people, especially in Sri Lanka, is, is very hard. Uh, especially like us, when you work in international context, to be able to talk to clients, email with clients, and liaise with them, know what they understand, it, it is really hard. And it takes a lot of time and effort and training to train them on what, what you need to do. Yeah. But, I mean, you're right, I mean, the best, obviously, the best, best people who to start companies, but uh, not everybody does that. Uh, might change, and everybody might want to start companies, but you never know. Yeah. <laughs> right. One more question. Yeah, that, be, that brings me to another question. Yeah, you hire a guy, which is, he's really, for example, he's really good at, at technical stuff, mm -hmm. and he's he's one of a kind guy where you can you can't find anyone like him ever again. But this guy is not a team player, and he's a, he's a, he's a problem a, employee. So what, that's what a, should I do? That's a really, really good question. I mean, it, this, this, is, this will sound very harsh. But uh, the way it works is, those type of people are very useful at the time you start your company. Because but the moment your company starts to get streamlined, and you start setting up processes, those type of people become more of an encumbrance than, than useful. So those people also have to be intelligent enough to know how to, when they've got a good thing, and know how to adapt. And through personal experience, I know that. I know the companies I worked in England, after about three or four years, all the good guys used to get pushed out. You know, those type of guys used to be very stubborn and just do things. Yeah, you go get into it. Because, I mean, eventually the company's got to go in a direction and that's decided by the management based on whatever, funding, shareholders, whatever. But if somebody is trying to push them in another direction, then it's going to disrupt the work of everybody else. And that's usually how it works, unfortunately. Yeah. So you have to be good, but you also have to know how to adapt and know when to keep quiet as well. It doesn't yeah. fit in with Yeah. I mean, through experience, this is usually the So I mean, when you're starting up and you have only three people in your company, you own these people. Uh, but four years down the line, not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.
uh, remember that we have different types of GPT events. So when you're registering, just pick and choose the ones you want. Just wait for what you really want to come for and just pick that one. Um, so one, um, we have a, a Google Plus page and a Facebook page so that we announce all our events and all the other details on those. Then we have a Google Plus community and a Facebook group where you guys can join and you guys can you know interact with each other, talk about NC. Uh, also, you can don't forget to follow us on Twitter, right? Number two, Wow is coming up. Okay, what's Wow? Uh, so this year, Google, uh, sorry, uh, GPT is giving special attention to women, uh, especially women entrepreneurs. So uh, they're going to um, uh, come up with the. Uh, actually, we are going to come up with uh, all over the world. Uh, GPT is coming up with the initiative called Women on Web. So um, that's gonna uh, the launch will be somewhere in March. We will let you know when. So uh, any ladies here, uh, you're most welcome to join. Uh, your friends, um, sisters, uh, whoever, uh, tell all the female entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs you uh, you know uh, about this venture. We will be announcing all the details on our pages. And uh, three, um, those who didn't uh, register. Uh, those who registered but forgot to give your name at the uh, desk, uh, please send us your details. We just want your name and your email. Uh, email us or send us on Twitter or send us on uh, any of our pages. Just let us know because uh, we want to send you all our feedback form which is really, really important to us. Uh, just fill it up and send. Uh, and, yeah, that's all I guess. Um, we are on gbgcolombo at gmail.com or we are on Twitter gbgcolombo. And finally, refreshments are there. So please have something to eat, drink, have a chat if you have time and come back and see you guys soon. Bye.